Okay. Uh, let's start the third the 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 third the third panel of our of our seminar today. The seminar post pandemic world global transformation challenges for development. So uh, the the title of our our panel is uh, no uh, new technologies global security challenges. This is not a uh, a issue for post pandemic world. This is a issue for the today's world and also the post pandemic world too. So we. This is a big issue in the society today. And uh, these issues is, uh, of course, present in our lives, you know, in a in a day by day, in a day by day life, including uh, the politics, the social life, the technology and so on. So the the we have today some some uh, some new technologies that's not so new but new technologies that we we are facing today and this uh, this technolo technology like the connectivity technology 5G the uh, intelligence artificial uh, the artificial intelligence AI the cloud computing the uh, ubiquity of the computing is present in our lives so and the, the 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 collection of these technologies can influence in this the the civil society very deeply. This is the point. This is the point today. Today we are facing a, a very huge access to to internet because the uh, the online the 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 online the the online online work that we are, we are facing today. Uh, I think no, I don't have the the real the real figures, but I think that today the connection for the home office is the biggest in all times in the world. So we are connected to the world every time, every day, uh, to 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 performance work, or, or, or to perform our work. This is a big challenge. There's a big challenge on security. There's a big challenge on, on the on the on the uh, our day uh, our day daily life. So the, we we will have today uh, these uh, the two two panelists. Né? We have Carlos Oliveira from from the EU delegation in Brasilia and Demi Getchko uh, from the uh, from the 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 the, the Nick uh, Nick BR, so we will start our uh, our uh, presentations with uh, with Demi's presentation. But before I want to introduce them, the the the, the first thing that I have I have to say about Demi, Demi is that he is a very old friend from mine. So and uh, from maybe from the, the school chairs to today. So it's a very long time. David today is, a, is, a, is a, a president of the uh, Nick BR. This is a, uh, the, the, the Nick BR, I think that everyone know, is the, uh, the responsible for the, uh, for the, the, the coordination of the .dr uh, in, in in Brazil. So Demi also is a is a, uh, is a member of the ICANN, and also uh, has a lot of a lot of uh, awards and uh, in the uh, uh, along his career. His care because he's a very influent. Uh, a very, he is very influent in the internet issues around the world. So uh, Demi got his uh, his bachelor uh, in Escola Politécnica of University of São Paulo, and as well the master degree and PhD degree. Okay, this is a uh, this Demi 
this is the the very brief bio of uh, of them. If them want to to complement this, please uh, feel free to do that. Then you have 30 minutes uh, for your presentation, more or less. Do, do, uh, if you want, uh, please could you could you start? Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, once here, it's, uh, it's an honor, honor to be with, with you and this interesting panel. As you said, we are very old friends from the uh, beginning in the Polytechnical School many years ago. Uh, anyway, uh, first, uh, I'm kind of an uh, internet guy, of course, uh, working for the Brazilian .br registry. And my involvement with, with telecom is uh, a little bit aside of, of the normal issues that is to, to run the .br registry. Uh, just to speak very shortly about that, uh, the .br was uh, uh, delegated in 80, uh, 89, uh, 1989, and uh, at uh, 11th April, and I think it's a quite successful registry. We just reached uh, 4.5 million of uh, registered domains this year, and we also are responsible for Assigning, assigning autonomous system numbers uh, and the uh, local distribution of IP version 4 and IPv6 also numbers in country level. Uh, we are uh, a private, non-for-profit organization and we, under the, the steering of the CGI, the Steering Committee of Internet in Brazil, we reallocate uh, uh, the surplus we got from the .br registry to other uh, Brazilian internet initiatives. For example, we host the CERT, the Brazilian Computer Emergency Response Team. It's very important cru and crucial in these times, as Moacir said. And uh, the, the, the Brazilian uh, Internet Exchange System, the, I, I, we call it PTT, uh, uh, but uh, the, the correct name is I, I, IX, the Internet Exchange. Uh, our IX is the, the fourth worldly. It's it's a, have a very good size. And just three months ago, uh, the Brazil, the São Paulo IX, the, the São Paulo individual IX, uh, become the, the biggest individual IX in transit, surpassing the Frankfurt IX that was the, the, the first one until three months ago. So, uh, uh, it, it, beginning in our issue. First of all, I, I think we have to divide the, the, the theme of the discussion between what, what is the security problems with uh, 5G and what, what uh, are the security problems that are arising from the pandemics and the actual situation we face today. Uh, as a matter of fact, and also doing some good uh, image from, from Brazil, we are, we are quite uh, uh, well uh, uh, considered in the internet arena as for the legislation for internet. We, uh, the, the CGI published the Decalog in 2009. It was very well received in the IGF fora. I remember that time in the, it was the Vilnius IGF in 2010. And based in this Decalog, we got the internet uh, civil framework, the Marco Civil, that was signed in uh, 2014. 14. And uh, uh, the, the, the signature was during the Net Mundial meeting. And just to, to sh uh, shortly say that the Net Mundial meeting was a spe very special international multi stakeholder meeting because could produce uh, two consensual documents, on, one on principles, uh, digital rights and things like that, and the other in the ways to go forward. And uh, finally, this year we have our uh, National Private Data Authority implemented uh, that with uh, the general law of personal data protection, we are in a good uh, frame to, to see in the area of internet legislation worldwide. Okay, of course, uh, 5G is uh, today's hype. It's, uh, it's a very important issue because it impacts strongly the business side and, of course, the telecommunication side and also the internet because uh, uh, our personal way to connect to the internet could be very much improved with more bandwidth, with uh, less latency, and uh, uh, with, with good uh, mobility. The 5G is very good to improve the mobility we have right now for 3, 4G and 3G. Uh, not to mention the Internet of Things, 
that is uh, uh, it's, it's uh, normally publicized that the Internet of Things will be strongly depend on 5G. I have some personal views on that. I think uh, Internet of Things is a mixture of a lot of solutions. There is no uh, uh, something like a silver bullet for resolve the Internet of Things uh, issues or even the Internet issues. I think 5G is a very important tool to add to this uh, uh, co uh, constellation of tools we have for the internet. But if you think in, in Internet of Things, you have to remind that there is things that requires uh, la a large bandwidth, wide bandwidth, like, for example, health uh, systems. You can have uh, a remote procedures uh, that uh, have to have uh, uh, very small la latency and have to have very good uh, quality of communication. So. But uh, we could do this Internet of Things in car, uh, automatic, automated cars, and so on. There is a lot of uh, important uh, uh, applications where we will need a wide uh, band. But there is also a lot of a very small bandwidth. Uh, this meeting uh, is issues. being recorded. Uh, like, for example, the, the, the sensors. Which if you think about, uh, for example, agribusiness, the, 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 the sensors that are... Uh, in the, the field for sensing pH or sensing uh, humidity or say, say sensing any other uh, uh, informations that are vital for producing uh, agri agricultural goods, this kind of, of sensors are very uh, 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 few, uh, are demanding very, very few bandwidth. That they don't need uh, to trans transmit uh, megabits of, of information, they just want to transmit some bits. Then is, this is part, of course, of uh, IoT also. And of course, if you are inside your home, probably you will continue to use Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or other, or other technology. Then uh, uh, 5G is very important for expand our personal mobility, for expand our bandwidth and our capacity to, to get streaming and other things while, while, while moving uh, uh, through the, the, the country. But uh, uh, for Internet of Things, we have to have a mix, a mixture of, of solutions, with solutions with low power, with low bandwidth, also with wide bandwidth. It's a mixture of things that will be provide the enrichment of the scenario for the Internet of Things. Uh, of course, uh, security uh, considerations uh, uh, arise not, not just uh, of the, the technological characteristics of 5G. Of course, uh, any new technology tends to be more secure than the older in the same area because you, you, it, it involved a lot of new development, uh, not uh, new research on the area, and probably we can say quite certainly that new technologies tend to be more secure than the old ones. But the problem with, with 5G and, and the internet uh, things is that it will be widespread in a, in a such way that we will have a lot of, of, of other options that can be ways to attack the system. And then there will be a lot of new ways through which the, the, the adversaries can attack uh, one system or one device. Uh, just to, to put this a little bit in a framing, uh, of course, we have our personal data we have our privacy that can, can be endangered because uh, mm -hmm. actually our privacy, the privacy can, can be endangered by our devices, our home devices that can send information that is not uh, the, 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 what we, we, we hope to be sending around. Uh, and you, you, how so you can, uh, that the, the attackers can, uh, 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 can, can focus on the, infinity of, of devices connected to the internet to, to take in over and, and construct botnets that are the, the ways you can have uh, denial of service attacks. The denial of service attacks attack is one of the very frequent attacks we have nowadays because can use also politically or uh, in some way to, to disrupt services that are uh, in different way, uh, ways uh, uh, in, in target of the, the attackers. Then uh, we, we have to be aware of, uh, of course, when uh, personal cars and health, uh, health appliances and other applications 
uh, will be also connected to the internet that it's doing right now. This could be critical, and we have to bring in our mind uh, tough security uh, requirements for for the, the the challenge that 5G will bring to us. Well, the the, the pandemics uh, <coughs> uh, showed to 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 all of us uh, that uh, work it as a strong accelerator. Uh, towards the digital migration. Of course, all of us are uh, looking to a digital migration uh, sooner or later, but the pandemic accelerated this in a very strong way. And we observed that in, in the equivalent of, of five or six months, we have more than five years of progress uh, expected in the old pace. And what, what we have expected to be in five years, we got in, in six or seven months because of the acceleration of, of COVID. Of course, the, the impact is in security is that a lot of, of services that was uh, in some way protected uh, through wallet gardens, to buildings, to physical protection that just allow the access to some persons uh, physically. Now it's, it's running uh, uh, via the internet. And of course, uh, it, it works as a tractor to, to attacks because there is a lot of data now transiting uh, through uh, uh, optical fiber, through Wi-Fi, through uh, 4G, 3G, and in the future 5G. And it's not uh, really true that these systems was uh, even well designed to be migrated to the, the, to the virtual world. Then it's important that the, the, the institutions that move their, their applications from the physical uh, environment with buildings, with, with wallet gardens, with uh, uh, entry points, uh, che checking at entry points to the network, uh, sometimes the uh, security provisions are uh, obviously not sufficient in the new era and in the new uh, <coughs> scenario. And if you, uh, uh, if you expand this to, to critical services like uh, electricity or health or, or other uh, services uh, in a city or intelligent cities, another important issue connected to Internet of Things and connected to Internet and connected, of course, also to 5G. If you expand to this, you see that we have a scenario that you have to be a little bit worried about the, the, where we are sitting there and just to, to, to put also some Brazilian numbers I collected this day. Uh, first of all, we have three good uh, uh, webinars about the impact of the COVID in three areas that is important to consider. One is education. Of course, it's, it's uh, more or less obvious that the, the gap in education could be very, uh, uh, could be increased uh, much if you have different uh, uh, quality of access. Uh, to have uh, remote education, we have to have good access, good quality of access to the internet. And this is not, of course, a reality in the whole country. Uh, 75 of the Brazilians are today connected to the internet in some way, not, not of course, in the same way all the all the We have different bandwidths over the country, different forms of access. But more or less, we, we have three quarters of the Brazilian connected. And this is also clear in the business sector, where the, the fibers, fiber, optic fibers, are uh, most widely used access technology with 67% of, of business, even the small business, small ones, using uh, uh, fiber to get connection to, to the internet. This is good because fiber provides uh, good stability, less packet loss, uh, packet loss uh, low cost, and very high bandwidth without uh, big uh, costs in, in material because fiber is, is, is more or less cheap material. Well, uh, just to, to say a little bit about automation, automatization, uh, just 4% of the Brazilian enterprises uh, uh, told that are using uh, industrial robots. And if you go to the industry of the transformation, uh, we have 12%, a little bit bigger, and in the in the logistic, 2% of Brazilian enterprises try to use uh, uh, automatized uh, forms of delivery. Uh, again, in, in, in the 5, 5G, you have 
to, to have two or three technologies in Internet of Things, you have uh, uh, LTE uh, slash M, that is the long-term evolution, machine-to-machine -machine type communications, normally using wide band and so, and you have narrow band Internet of Things, and B, IoT, uh, that probably you will try to use the free spectrum to provide uh, 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 low power and uh, a wide range uh, uh, network. Uh, they are expecting to, to have 25 billions of connections until 2025 worldly. Then it's, of course, uh, important to keep an eye on that. Oh, well, finally, just to comment more, more or less some other things in, in 5G. Of course, uh, uh, the 5G has the, the mobility as one of the strong uh, aspects, so strong characteristics of, of it. But of course, also you, you can probably, probably locate very well the user of, uh, of 5G uh, protocols, and your privacy will be, of course, uh, uh, endangered in some way. But of course, there are some ways to protect it. One, one good thing that I can say is that cryptography uh, implementing the 5G seems to be much better than the 3 and 4G. Then probably we will have men, uh, less vulnerability in 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 in. Uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, assessing the content because the cryptography, cryptography used in 5G is uh, much more strong. Uh, the other thing that's important is that, that in some way the 5G could slice the network in, in, in some kind of personal uh, subnets. This is good because it it's makes uh, less prone to, to attack the central structure than if you have a distributor uh, structure with, with small sliced networks for, for the users. Uh, if this sliced network are attacked, this in some way do, doesn't compromise the, the, the core of the system. Then it's important to have in mind that we have probably a, a better situation uh, because of that. Uh, I think that uh, fi uh, f f putting the final points, of course, that they were aware that there will be security problems with 5G. We have a lot of security problems with the pandemic. It's it's clear worldwide, even in our country, we have a lot of problems the last days about that. And of course, it's true that 5G will offer huge benefits. But one, one thing is certain, the technology will require much more focus on security. Uh, 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 to, to be re really going towards a, a digital world uh, that will be very useful for all of us, we cannot lose the view of the security needs and we have to, to pay a lot of attention on that. Uh, thank you, I'm open uh, for questions after that. Thank you. Thank you, Demi, for a very comprehensive, uh, comprehensive uh, presentation, very good. And I have a, a couple of questions to to make to you, but after after the present the Carlos presentation, Carlos, are you ready? Carlos, Amasio, do you know what about Carlos? No, it didn't work. He couldn't send the the email. I can just a moment. So, uh, could you could you please try to connect Carlos and uh, uh, in this yes, meanwhile? Can you hear me now? Oh yes. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if you can see me, but at least I can hear you, and you can hear me, which is I think uh, quite an improvement. I have to admit that all normally this always works well, but uh, to prove that Mr. Murphy was a remarkable thinker. If something can go wrong, it can, it will go wrong at the worst possible moment. <laughs> anyway. Do you know Lady Brooks? Brooks Law? Okay. Uh, so I, I I want to say a few words about about uh, okay. about uh, Carlos Bio. And uh, after that, Carlos, if you if you agree. You can start your presentation, okay? Perfect. So, uh, Carlos is also my my longtime friend, and uh, it's a pleasure for me having two two 
old friends in the same panel. Talk is a very exciting, a very exciting topic. Well, Carlos is a, is a counselor, counselor uh, for information society and digital market at the EU delegation in Brazil. Uh, in, uh, he in this uh, in this position, he is supporting the EU Brazil cooperation in the ICT policies like uh, digital single market, uh, digital digital digitalization of industry and ICT research and innovation. He is responsible, for example, for the the collaborative collaborative projects in ICT Brazil uh, uh, European Union. So, uh, formerly he was uh, re head of the sector at European head of sector uh, at the European Commission in the DG, Con DG Connect uh, in Brussels. Uh, Carlos uh, holds his uh, uh, master degree and bachelor degree in computer system and telecommunication engineering uh, by the Technical University of Lisbon and also the master degree in public policy by the London School of Economics and Political Sciences. Uh, Carlos, if you, if you want to, to add something, feel free to do that. And uh, you have uh, 30 minutes to your presentation, okay? Thank you very much. Well, my first words are to address my compliments to certainly Professor Moacir Martucci that kindly invited me to join this 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 uh, this event, uh, but also to the other distinguished panelists. Uh, Demi Gechko is a old acquaintance also of, since my arrival here in Brazil. I have uh, had the chance of, uh, uh, I mean, exchanging views with him on a number of occasions, and I have to say that I, I look at his uh, performance at the helmet, uh, Nick Villar, as actually something really uh, an exemplar, uh, uh, an example of, of, of uh, very committed work towards the development of internet to the benefit of, uh, of the community as a whole and not only on a pure uh, commercial basis. So I think it's someone that I have a special uh, appreciation also. And of course, I would like to address my compliments to the remaining members uh, of the panel, uh, Professor uh, um, Amancio, that kindly managed to put my slides on the screen despite my unsuccessful attempts. So many thanks. Um, I, I, I would perhaps start before we move into the next slide, say just a few words about uh, the title, New Technologies, Security Challenges. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'm going to focus is very much on the digital side. But in reality, in times of uh, uh, what we might call technological transition, like the ones that we are going through with the strong emphasis that we are putting, for instance, on the, uh, from the European side on the Green Deal, which to some extent is also a, a way of presenting a technological rupture. Um, but also in the digital, we may say that the digital is already in the agenda for many years, but there are... Uh, uh, a number of uh, aspects of the digital that are now being combined in such a way that it makes really, creates really the potential for more disruptive changes in the way we work, in the way we spend our day-to-day uh, -day, uh, life, uh, going from the uh, shopping to uh, the entertainment uh, activities. Uh, and of course, the pandemic may not be, let's say, a decisive element per se, but it created a concourse of circumstances that somehow brought the attention to how our lives have the potential to really be completely changed by the fact that many of our work can be done um, uh, remotely by thanks to internet, but at the same time, how this also becomes an element of uh, division uh, for those that uh, uh, whose nature of work is not really adaptable to uh, uh, electronic mediated process of engagement with, with their work. Um, I mean, this very much is something that is influencing the way we have been looking at the European digital strategy. Of course, we have from one side a very strong emphasis on the technologies, 
but also we have a number of surrounding conditions that largely uh, um, determine the way we are going to uh, address these, these aspects. I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Um, and of course, I'll leave a few things for the possible questions that uh, are likely to arise after, even to give a little bit of space. Next slide, please. Well, health technologies, I think that uh, Professor Moasir and, and also uh, uh, Demi also alluded to some of the distinguishing elements. Okay, the role of uh, artificial intelligence, um, even something as mundane as cloud computing that now, I mean, everybody uh, takes it as more or less part of the usual landscape, uh, but also new developments like blockchain, like quantum computing are largely making changes in the way we interact with, um, with technology, the extent to which it really replaces even uh, the human intervention in many aspects, but also its influence when we discuss something like security. I mean, nowadays, uh, the tra tra traditional uh, cryptography that used to be considered as uh, reasonably secure with the computing uh, capacity available, that's no longer the case because you can much more easily put or assemble the computing capacity needed to break 256 uh, DAS, for instance, which when I was working in this area used to be considered a fairly safe and fairly secure approach. Of course, 5G also plays a very important role in this. And I would say 5G and Internet of Things. And that's the reason why from the Commission side, we have a given a special attention to the cybersecurity challenges. And I'll talk a little bit about this in the, in the, uh, during my, my, my brief introduction. Next slide, please. Well, I mean, this is uh, probably something that by itself doesn't say anything new, but uh, I, I, I keep insisting that 5G is not so much about the speed because the speed uh, is, is just, let's say, a, an additional enabler. I think that we, what is more important is the connectivity element and how we really have an ecosystem that brings together a very wide range of um, applications that deal with our day-to-day -day experience. Uh, we have the 5G that can interact with smart grids, that can interact with connected vehicles. I mean, in Europe, for instance, we have already performed a number of experiments around connected vehicles. We have also uh, 5G in uh, wealth of applications dealing with uh, e-health. I mean, for instance, with Brazil, we have a number of, uh, at least one project that deals with uh, the topic of e-health and well-being. Um, and we could expand this uh, beyond, uh, uh, almost beyond reach because it is also influencing the way uh, utilities deal with, uh, for instance, water supply, water distribution. It deals also with uh, aspects that have to do with the way we manage our, our buildings to make them more energy efficient. And I'm not even, it's perhaps not fully visible here, but you could put also in this context, the drones that we can see in the future delivering our uh, parcels uh, at home. So this is just to give, let's say, an idea that because we have such kind of broad interconnectivity and the uh, interdependence of the various systems, this also raises the a very important challenge of how to preserve the security of this environment. Next, please. Uh, of course, a very important thing in this context is also the way we discuss this in terms of international uh, cooperation. Uh, of course, um, we can um, adopt uh, the isolationist approach of saying we want to be the greatest country on this matter and the others will follow us no matter what. We believe in Europe that actually that's not really the most efficient way of dealing, of, 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 of addressing these issues. And it's very important to actually bring together all the important partners that are dealing with this matter. And in 5G, it's a very concrete example. But you could think also of others, for instance, we have had a very proficuous uh, development, for instance, on the topic of uh, uh, data protection um, and uh, ultimately data privacy with uh, both Japan, Korea, and of course, Brazil. Next, please. Well, artificial intelligence is probably one of the things that comes to our mind more immediately. We have developed a, a very interesting uh, uh, reflection 
uh, not only ourselves, but actually have been sharing these in the international inst instances like the OECD. Next, please. Um, which is uh, how to really make this uh, something that is for the benefit of, of the people and doesn't really become uh, the realization of this uh, uh, mantra of uh, uh, computers and drones and uh, robots controlling humans. That's not really what we expect, but that means also having a deeper reflection on this matter. Um, perhaps one of the most important things beyond all, all those that figure in the slide is the ethical and legal framework for AI. Because in fact, um, technologies are not completely, um, completely, let's say, ethical. The ethical element that exists in it is inserted by, by humans and we need to have a very strong care about things like privacy, data governance, about also human agency and oversight. I mean, uh, there must be someone that actually takes control whenever is needed. And of course, all the issues that we talked already about, uh, security and safety, transparency, but also things that sometimes we don't think too much that have to do with uh, the way some of, uh, some of the algorithms work that have some embedded uh, bias in the way they look at people just on the basis of their color or their gender or any other things because to some extent they reflect the data space from which they learn. Next, please. Uh, um, another very important topic that I think links very much to the topic, to the, to the main theme of our conversation is cybersecurity. Uh, of course, this is also an area that has dramatically increased of importance with time, because it's it's a very important uh, and very difficult challenge. As you can see in the next slide, it's also a matter of discussing. On one side, how can we really trust on our partners, but also on the other side, how can we really safeguard ourselves, not only from our friends, but also from uh, even unknown threats that can come around. I mean, one of the things that becomes very often evident when we look at the scenario that I was presenting earlier, of course, we tend to put and to place our attention very much on what are the common threats of uh, uh, maybe other countries, typically rogue states. But in fact, one of the most uh, uh, sensible concerns that have come around over the last few years is really the importance of cyber crime and cyber threats. I mean, just looking at the news, during this period of, uh, of, the, of the COVID, uh, where people were very much highly relying on, on uh, electronic transactions and uh, all forms of electronic mediated communication, we heard about an increasing number of situations of uh, uh, cyber attacks of any sort from the most simple social engineering and so on. I think that, for instance, in Brazil, a number of cases were reported. Uh, during the deployment of the uh, of the um, emergency uh, help, um, and that's not really because the technology was not uh, secure by itself. It's, it's just because they are uh, very subtle ways of uh, profiting from uh, people's goodwill uh, on these. For instance, uh, in my home country or the country that I know best, is an expression that is very common. Uh, recently, with the deployment of uh, uh, instant uh, payments, we had a number of cases of people actually suggesting the others that, oh, you have a problem with your uh, with your payment. Uh, can you please type uh, or can you please uh, retype or give me your your uh, your pins, things like that, which sometimes you might look, think that this is pretty obvious and people will not fall in such kind of threat, but uh, the situation is created that people very easily fall on it. We are listing here a number of activities that are taking place from our side on these. Perhaps the most important is the Cybersecurity Act because it provides the overall framework for what we are doing. Uh, but also equally important is the uh, activities that deal with, um, uh, for instance, the most, let's say, uh, uh, the most uh, spoken topic, which is 5G security. I mean, the approach of the European Commission is very much about uh, focusing on an objective assessment of what are the potential threats, 
how these threats are being handled by the different equipment and software suppliers and use this as a basis to instruct, in our case, the member states on how to address these threats. And that's the reason, for instance, why we are talking about, for instance, do not rely on a single supplier, uh, embed in the design of the network the adequate procedures for um, uh, minimizing the points of single failure and, and single single uh, attack, and this has very much been uh, developed with a strong cooperation with uh, ENISA. Uh, just perhaps mentioning something, uh, we have been working very hard also on developing our own capacities in the area of cyber security, especially with the ECHOS, the European Consortium for uh, Security. Uh, uh, operations, which is one of the partners of this uh, uh, research uh, partnership with the private sector. Next slide, please. Well, ENISA is perhaps the most prominent entity that is working with the Commission on these areas. I mean, I'm just listing two particular instances of our work. One has to do with the 5G toolbox, which is precisely the kind of, uh, I'm going to simplify a little bit the discourse by saying it's some kind of checklist of how to assess if a network is adequately secure or not, uh, almost to uh, guidelines on how to perform a security audit on the um, 5G infrastructure of a country, uh, but also other things that have to do with the, with the, with the overall context in which uh, our cyberspace is uh, currently run, obviously with a specific focus on the European context. One here that I mentioned is how the telecom system worked during the pandemic. But for instance, to give also another example, one of the very interesting reports that we have has to do with how to read, how secure are, for instance, the uh, electronic systems of uh, our cars that we use on a daily basis, the so-called CAN bus. How secure is it? What are the threats? What are the risks that are associated to this? And this is very important when you think about connected vehicles. Next, please. Well, uh, uh, this is very much one of the things that actually came as a very strong element of the big uh, initiative, Green and Digital Recovery. Uh, I, I'm not going to elaborate too much on it, but just to say that the aspects of uh, reinforcing the resilience of our infrastructure uh, for healthcare and for many other aspects is one of the major priorities of the next generation EU, which is also known as the green and digital recovery. Uh, of course, there are other things that are part of the overall goal of uh, recovering the economy, but we always keep a very strong eye on less, uh, learning the lessons from COVID uh, pandemic, because unfortunately, we have to consider that this is not going to be the last one and we need to be better prepared for the coming one. Next, please. Uh, just me say a few words about the very intense EU-Brazil cooperation on this area, because in some of these uh, topics, we are going to touch also the issues that we had been uh, addressing. Next, please. I think we're going to have here the picture of the people that attended uh, the 11th dialogue on EU-Brazil on digital economy, I think that if you enlarge a little bit, you can see that Professor Moasir is there. Uh, my compliments. We have also uh, Secretary um, Paulo Alvim. We have also um, uh, now Executive Secretary Vitor Menezes, that is also is in the center. We have also uh, my colleague Kali Luana, who co chaired also the meeting together with the Brazilian. Uh, participant with Brazilian state secretaries, and of course also uh, Ambassador Marcos Galvão from the uh, um, Brazilian mission to the EU. Perhaps interesting to give a quick look at what we talked about. Uh, next, please. Well, of course, we couldn't really miss 5G and beyond, and of course IoT. I mean, I tend to look at a little bit along the, the lines of what uh, Demi mentioned, I tend to look at uh, uh, IoT as almost, let's say, a, a tool to make everything connected, uh, but in itself is not uh, something that we could discuss or present as a, grand, a groundbreaking technology per se. Artificial intelligence, 
blockchain and quantum computing, high performance computing, which to some extent is almost, let's say, a, um, something that has a, an additional step with quantum, cybersecurity and 5G security, digitization of industry, industry 4.0, agriculture, smart cities, smart mobility, digital governments, including digital signatures. This is just to give, let's say, a, an overall picture of what were, let's say, the main uh, uh, topics that structured our conversation. And we try to understand how we could better cooperate around this. Because, I mean, when we have a situation where all the networks are being connected, um, let's face it, when something fails, uh, the propagation of the threat across the global networks is almost unstoppable. We had a number of examples of this in the past few years with the ransomware that was distributed where before we could realize the thing was already spread all over the place, there were no firewalls that could stop it. Uh, so this is something that remains uh, an area where international cooperation is absolutely crucial. Because more important even than the threats coming from people uh, from rogue states is also the cyber crime. Next, please. Well, we also have an interesting conversation about the developments around digital economy. And to some extent, the fact that digital economy is becoming so prevalent also uh, exposes a number of additional uh, fragilities and, and, and vulnerabilities of our uh, technological ecosystem. Um, next, please. Uh, let me just say here a little word about uh, our groundbreak uh, development, which is the submarine cable connecting EU to Brazil. Well, as you probably know, at the moment, the connection or the traffic going to Europe actually doesn't go through this more straightforward connection. Actually, it has a deviation towards north direction to Miami, eventually somewhere a little bit further to the north, it crosses the Atlantic or the North Atlantic and arrives into the British, British Islands. And uh, hopefully by the end, it will arrive at the European Union. Well, as a matter of fact, when the decision was taken to go ahead with this project, one of the things that we have discovered is that in reality, the fact that uh, um, the network or the connection was going through uh, friendly countries doesn't, wasn't necessarily a guarantee of the preservation of the security and confidentiality of the communications. And that's the reason why we, are, we thought that this was actually also a very good reason to increase the resilience of our connectivity between Europe and, and, uh, and Brazil, ultimately also to the whole uh, South America. We hope that actually in the next uh, few months, we have this uh, connection fully operational. Uh, our uh, estimation is the first quarter of 2021. Next, please. I mean, I'm just going to say a very brief word about personal data protection. Well, nowadays, what we see is that data tra travels around the world in every possible direction. And therefore, it's very important that we progress towards common standards of data protection. I think that we have made quite a good work between Brazil and the EU in this area because we have very convergent views about this. And we worked very much in connection with the Brazilian legislators in the preparation of this um, of the LGPD and also are sharing with Brazil also our lessons learned about two years of GDPR. Uh, and we hope that this will be also a way of also engaging more countries in, in South America and around the world uh, to a notion of uh, a common uh, space for data sharing, but also for data protection. Next, please. Well, uh, just a few days ago, we had actually a very interesting uh, uh, debate between uh, Minister Marcos Pontes and uh, Roberto Viola, the Director General of DigiConnect. Actually, it was the second time that they had the chance of meeting. And uh, if I'm putting a bit of more emphasis on the Director General, it's because in the European context, even if that might look a little bit, let's say, uh, uh, unusual from a Brazilian point of view, we could almost say that even if our political masters are the commissioners, in general, the director generals outlive the mandate of a commissioner. Uh, so they are, let's say, a guarantee of continuity. And also, this very much reflects 
uh, an element of the European integration process, which is, uh, let's put it, uh, very much driven by facts and evidence, and a little bit less determined by the solely by the political circumstances. Even, of course, the political circumstances always play a very important role, and the current debate about the uh, recovery plan and the fin financing of the recovery plan also illustrate that importance. So I'm not under uh, undervaluing the importance of the political uh, of our political masters. Next, please. I mean, the COVID actually was a very interesting illustration of all the importance of, of, of these. I mean, we tend to think very much about what can we do in terms of uh, um, discovering new vaccines, discovering new uh, treatments, and we tend to put all these very much in the context of the medical research. But in reality, for the case of COVID, uh, there was a remarkable contribution that was given by the Util, ut, by the tools of the digital research, because, for instance, the uh, computers, the supercomputing system in Europe uh, worked uh, tremendously together with uh, uh, partners in the US, also in Korea, to discover and to synthesize new medicines, also in the discovery of, uh, of, the, of the, or the synthesis of the new vaccine. And it is something that sometimes go uh, astray. At the same time, as the things become more digital, it also became another element that needs uh, stronger protection, uh, stronger security measures, because we could also imagine uh, a conflict driven by a bio war uh, using, using these tools. Next, please. Uh, I'm gonna not elaborate too much on Horizon Europe because that's probably less relevant for us. Please, next. Uh, next. And next. I mean, what what we we I would like to 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 say is that in reality there is some some interesting something very interesting that we are working with, uh, and we have uh, very interesting projects for the future is about something that is called destination Earth. It's very much about exploring the possibility of developing a, a digital twin of the Earth that allows us to really better prepare the next pandemic, but also the evolution of the planet as a whole, as a broader ecosystem. Uh, and that very much relies on data that is going to be collective, not only in Europe, but around the world, uh, to feed into this, into this model. Uh, next, please. Um, next. Let me just say a few words about Galileo. I mean, we are talking very much about security. And one of the things that actually people are used to, 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 to say is that now almost every car that is sold all over the world comes with a GPS system. Actually, we have one uh, GPS uh, receptor in our, in our mobile phones, in our smartphones. What uh, Europe is doing with Galileo is actually improving the current system to make it more reliable, more resilient, and also less vulnerable to what could be the potential interference of a, a single country that controls, at the moment, the global positioning system. That's our European response to the need for a universal uh, global satellite navigation system. And, of course, this has applications all over the world uh, in almost every area of our daily life, from the air navigation to vessel traffic management systems, but also in the farm, uh, not only in our mobiles. Uh, I think that I'm, I'm coming a little bit to the end of my presentation. Uh, the next slides are very much some reiteration of these. Uh, perhaps just mentioning that we are going to make a presentation of uh, Galileo in the just before Christmas, uh, because now we have a Galileo Information Center installed in Brazil. And another something that is a bit connected to what I was talking about, which is um, about the destination Earth, which is the possibility of actually integrating here the information of Earth observation coming from the Copernus, Copernicus uh, satellite, uh, um, uh, Copernicus satellite constellation. I mean, as a closing uh, statement, very briefly, I think I'm arriving to the end, is to say that what we see 
in terms of the future is that probably international cooperation around these topics is is becoming increasingly important. But also this comes with an element of uh, mutual trust that has to be built in the sense that uh, uh, the interdependence between the different uh, actors is such that um, there is no space really for just make our country important and, and great. We need to really develop effective mechanisms of cooperation that on one side um, reward people for and, and countries for that cooperation, but they also uh, penalize those that uh, don't follow the rules and don't really have the same care for the, for the common good. Uh, that's the reason why we put so much emphasis on multilateral cooperation on these on these on all these topics, which is not uh, an objection to have a, a strong effort in mastering the technologies and have our own capacity of of uh, understanding how these systems work and how each country can be effectively protected. Well, I would like to thank to to stop here. Probably some questions will arise. Thank you, Professor. Moasir, thank you all my panel uh, uh, colleagues. Over to you. Okay. Thank you very much for a very good presentation, uh, providing us with an update of the, the, technology, the, techno, the technology in Europe and also the updating the Brazil-EU uh, cooperation actions. That's very good. Okay, thank you very much. I I want to open the the floor or the video or the, or the micro the, the microphone to the audience to to questions. If someone uh, wants to make a question, please uh, raise the the hand. Uh, not not uh, yeah, yes, Eduardo Viola. And, and please. Vera, Eduardo first, Vera second. Eduardo? Are, are you hearing me? Yes, yes, Eduardo, yes. we are. So <clears throat> I, I would like to, to make a question about an issue that is uh, hot, but is more political somehow. How do you compare, this is addressed to both speakers, how do you compare the advantage of the and disadvantages uh, for a country like Brazil, but also for Europe, um, um, the this 5G of of Nokia, Ericsson, Samsung, and Huawei. <clears throat> do Do you want to make your question, uh, Vera, or I, I think that. Uh, one each time, oh, okay. Because I, I this answer. is a very specific question. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, Carlos, can you start, please? Uh, I was I was thinking that Demi was going to take the lead, but okay, because I was the second. Let oh. me go. Well, well, okay. uh, um, I mean, we 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 really think that actually, perhaps there are a certain number of myths that had been uh, propagated which are indeed do not reflect the reality. The first is that the 5G is a debate between, uh, or is, is a dispute between US and um, uh, uh, China. And in fact, I didn't elaborate too much on that, but uh, in reality, as far as uh, the early 2014, even a little bit earlier, we engaged with uh, partners in uh, Korea, in Japan, in China, actually in Brazil and even in the in, in US, precisely to promote some convergence about what should be 5G. Because we really wanted to have something that would be a universal system um, and an universal system that will provide secure forms of secure and reliable communication uh, across the globe in the context of 5G. I mean, in the period where it was already very visible and very apparent that we are moving from uh, um, closed ecosystems into increasingly interdependent uh, ecosystems uh, from a business point of view in terms of value chains and so on, 
that uh, if you don't trust on each other, the whole thing collapses. Um, and, and that's the reason why we believe it's very important to um, focus our attention in this debate, not so much about the company A, B or C, but more on the objective criteria that allows us to say the system is secure or the system is not secure. Uh, because in reality, even if you look at the... Uh, look a little bit back, we see that uh, the vulnerabilities of uh, IT systems are not uh, really exclusive of equipment coming from a particular country. Every system in the world has its uh, vulnerabilities, has its, its weaknesses. Of course, what we want to have also embedded in this debate is also a, 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 an equal level playing field in terms of how these companies operate, under which conditions they operate, what is the oversight mechanisms that exist to assess if they are complying with the, with the, with the rules. And such kind of oversight system cannot rely exclusively on the capabilities of a single country. I mean, uh, companies like Ericsson and Nokia, to give an example, are uh, publicly traded companies, uh, their operations, their uh, business practices, uh, their equipments are being... Uh, scrutinized all over the world from, uh, uh, let's say, Washington to Beijing, uh, to Tokyo. Um, I think that this is a very important element that you want that is applied exactly in the same terms to all the actors in, in this area. And of course, um, this doesn't prevent each individual country, as it is the case in Europe, of if he has uh, founded reasons to consider that a particular company is not playing the game of uh, imposing some restrictions on, on it. In terms of technological capabilities, uh, I would say that we are not talking about someone being, let's say, ahead of the others. I mean, there are uh, long debates about who has more patents. I mean, I think that each uh, country has its own narrative, and uh, in its narrative, it has also always more patents than the others. Um, I, I prefer not to engage too much into that debate. We tend to think that companies like uh, Ericsson and Nokia have uh, quite a strong position in this area. But as a matter of fact, one of the things that was at the, at the center of the debate when we were we had these discussions back five years ago or even more was precisely to create a situation where we didn't have a single country that uh, or a single company, let, put, let me put this way, a single company that could somehow take hostage of the others regarding what would be uh, the um, uh, ability to really use that essential patents for the deployment of the technology. And we had a little bit of that situation with 3G and um, uh, one of the companies that had a very strong position regarding one of the um, technologies being used in, in 3G. I mean, I I would stop perhaps here, maybe, and, and pass the word to Demi, and then we can uh, come back if there is a point that, in your view, I may not have fully answered. Okay. Demi, please. Okay, thank you. Now, first of all, I'll take advantage of a citation that uh, Carlos did. Uh, I remember in 96, uh, John Perry Barlow uh, made, made the... Uh, internet de uh, independent declaration of the cyberspace. And uh, uh, Antonio Guterres, the General Secretary of the United Nations, one year, two years ago, did the, 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 the actualization of this with the interdependent declaration of, of, of the, the digital world. Now, now we are in a world where the interdependence is, is clear and it's very important. And first of all, we, we are all interdependent in this world. There are many factors to consider when discussing this. There is one simple factor that is if you have a base, an installed base of some manufacturer, it could be easier to upgrade using the same manufacturer because I'm talking as a, if you are a telco company, because of course there is no standardization process to upgrade from 4G to 5G that is independent of companies. But if you want some kind of comments on, on security, uh, there is another question in this area. I, I will be uh, worried if you if you uh, discover, for example, uh, backdoors in honey equipment. Not, not because of, of international uh, uh, 
conspiratory theories about what we'll do with backdoors. But yeah, it, it, I remember, I suppose, 10 years ago, there, there was a problem with a backdoor in, in a, a manufacturer from Europe. Uh, the, the backdoor was uh, did in a good faith to recover uh, situations when you have uh, stuck it in some problems, then you can use this to recover uh, some, some device or some situation. But of course, this uh, falls in the, uh, uh, in the hands of the people of not with good faith. And if you have some kind of, of opening or some kind of door, uh, this will be explored by others. Then it's important not to, uh, like, like for example, that if you have back, back doors in cryptography, it, it is impossible to keep this in, in secure hands. Then it's much better not to have this kind of back doors anyway. Then uh, and not entering in other more complex discussions, it's important to get, guarantee that. For, for example, we, we have an important case of the, the DOS, the denial of service, the biggest DOS we, we have some time years ago was based in very small, simple cameras that installed in, in, in a lot of homes that has no any kind of security. And a lot of attackers could be living inside these, these cameras and, and provide a an, an, an big uh, uh, bot attack to, to, the, to the devices and to systems. Then it's very important to keep in mind security issues. I'm not talking in favor or in disfavor of any manufacturer or country, but uh, the, if you, if you you are involved in, in buying this kind of, of equipment for your country or for any uh, other situation, please uh, be aware to, to have a close look to the features of the equipment. Thank you. Thank you, Demi. There, this is a, a very good point because the, the, I think the culture of uh, cybersecurity is very important. You have, we have to have a like a program or like a, a public policy, something, something to maybe to increase the awareness of uh, cybersecurity in the population. There is a key point on that. Vera, the microphone is yours. Thank you. Uh, a question for, for the, the two uh, speakers. We are in the, in the academic field, uh, and we are following what's going on with uh, digital and worry about. Uh, the question is, what kind of jobs you disappear, certainly? Uh, and have the, the, has the European Union made some kind of research on the, the profile of persons in one hand that, uh, that are going to disappear, in the other hand that are going to, to be quite important? Because you are, in some sense, lost, right, in all this, with all this information. And we work with, uh, with students. It's important to tell them the truth, right? Thank you. Yes. Yes. Maybe maybe Jack should, maybe Demish could 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 start because to give him the chance of being the first speaker. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you decide. Okay, uh, I, I don't think I have very much to contribute on this. Of course, I'm also worried what will be the, the figure of the, the employment in the next years. Of course, the, the things that can be automated will be automated, and the people will lost the simple jobs that can be somewhere repetitive. I think the creativity is the the last barrier of the humanity in this in that situation, and we really hope that uh, we will have a lot of new jobs based on creativity and and, uh, and in, uh, ingenuity of of of, of men. Uh, in general, but I'm not sure about that. I'm not a specialist on that area, and I just can add my worries to Vera's worries. Thank you. Carlos? Oh, thank you very much. Well, well uh, um, I didn't mention something in the previous question, but i uh, just make a very short note. I mean, the issue is that a topic that is actually very close to various concerns, which is the issues around certification of equipment, is something that probably is going to give even increasing attention because it's a way of basically discovering some of the issues that were mentioned by Demi. And this is working on that, uh, but other entities around the world are also working. We have actually a very good and fruitful cooperation with Anatel also on, on those matters. Coming to the specific question, as a matter of fact, uh, I had in my slide something that was called prepare socioeconomic changes brought by artificial intelligence. And one is clearly jobs. The jobs that are going to disappear, 
the jobs that are going to be uh, the jobs and the requirements in terms of training uh, and, and capabilities that uh, are going to be brought by the future. Because, in fact, very often there is this kind of narrative that basically says, yes, some jobs will disappear, but you'll get others. The difficulty is that the ones that lost their jobs are not necessarily convertible, cannot be converted into uh, immediate actors for the new jobs that are being created. Um, we have actually a report and a very extensive reflection that was carried out on this, both uh, in a, uh, as part of the high-level reflection group on artificial intelligence, but also a, a specific uh, report that actually discusses this. Of course, there's an element of uh, uh, positive futurism around this debate because we normally tend to be a little bit optimistic about what the future will bring us. It's always better that way. Uh, and sometimes we don't, we're not fully able to really anticipate the impact that this has. Um, we were talking about the professions that are more uh, led by creativity. I think that one of the things that actually caught my attention some time ago was the fact that we could see a little novel that had been written by a, an artificial intelligence algorithm. So sometimes things go a little bit beyond our capabilities. On the other side, um, I think that actually this also create uh, this also depends on the way we we will also let's say position uh, machines in the context of our daily lives. They are there to help uh, people. They are not there to simply create let's say a, an oppressive uh, techno system that will really um, limit let's say our ability to express the best of uh, of, 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 of of humankind. Uh, nevertheless, I fully agree with you that this is a topic of great interest and what we can perceive at the moment is indeed what was mentioned by Demi. All the tasks that are more immediately automated uh, tend to be um, those that are easily scrapped. Still, for instance, there are some uh, counterintuitive findings. For instance, in, in, in Germany, we found that the fact that we had made an intensive use of robots in the car industry actually preserved that industry in uh, Germany or in Europe, if you want, instead of actually having it move to low uh, pay jobs countries. Because basically what happens is that uh, the work was much more focused on the things where the human intervention was, if not irreplaceable, in any case, would make a difference in terms of the quality of the final product, in terms of the sophistication of the product, much less than simply produce many things at a very low cost. Uh, that's a little bit my comment on this on this matter. Professor Moisir, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, any other questions, comments? I think there is a question in Q&A, Moisir. Oh, yes. It's a question from Tiago Feitosa. And uh, the question is, to which point, to which point American fear of China's 5G alternative can be regarded as a fair advice? That's a very tricky question. Yes, it is. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I have read a number of comments and observations on this matter, and there is one thing that actually caught my attention uh, uh, in a number of occasions. We have actually an uh, overwhelming presence of American companies, for instance, in the, the typical areas of uh, cloud, um, uh, software appliances uh, in general. I mean, if you think that ultimately a browser and uh, a mobile uh, perhaps a browser and many of the software that actually is running uh, several aspects of the internet comes from US companies. Um, I think actually perhaps we should put the things in these terms. Whoever is developing uh, a system, what we need to avoid is a situation of a, a monopoly or I would even say overwhelming monopoly. 
because uh, monopolies are not a very good uh, thing, especially if they are private monopolies, because there is no real effective oversight on, on, on private monopolies. And it's true that because of uh, digital economy uh, pre pre uh, allows for tremendous economies of scale, um, I mean, it's very difficult, for instance, to imagine a competitor to, to um, uh, Google in the current situation, because unless there is a dramatic uh, technological breakthrough that will make their products completely uh, outdated, um, it's very difficult that they can lose a little bit their, their dominance. And at the moment, we have already observed a number of situations where both from the typical GAFA companies, there is a, an abuse of their dominant position. Hopefully, in Europe, for instance, when we discuss 5G, we can even choose between two, Ericsson and Nokia, for instance. But um, And we'd like that that example will be also the case in many other areas because I think it's always better not to have, let's say, a, an excessive dependence on a single uh, supplier. Of course, uh, I think that our American friends might have their uh, own approach about 5G. Um, to some extent, even their emphasis on open run somehow mirrors a little bit of an idea of how to circumvent uh, or find other elements of interoperability within the 5G infrastructure. Um, I mean, I think that's all what I can say at this at this at this uh, uh, at this stage. Maybe Demi can help by bringing also his uh, insightful perspective on this. Uh, thank you. I have much, uh, a few things to add. I, I think you uh, pictured the, the scenario very well. Uh, I think if there is a way to go forward, of course, we have to be aware of, of monopolies and you have to be aware of not to buying uh, systems that can be compromised. I'm not so much involved with the uh, conspiration theory, but I, I really stress that we have to have equipment that has no vulnerabilities because it will be explored anyway. If you have some kind of vulnerability, it will be explored for for good or for bad, uh, independent of the, of the wish of the of the of the manufacturer or even of the country that uh, this manufacturer is on. Then I agree with this. I don't have much to add on that. Uh, we have to go forward with open eyes and with the, the, in good faith and preventing. To, to buy things that we put in danger our community. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Amancio Salej wants to, to ask a question on video. Can you open the microphone for him, please? Sure, sure I can. And uh, in this meeting, why? I, I want to, I, I want to, to make a comment and ask a question for both. There is a, uh, the topic is uh, ethical, the ethical uh, procedures using, uh, uh, using uh, when you use applications with uh, inter uh, IA and uh, cloud computer and so on. Those applications are international applications, are global applications. So if you have an, uh, a procedure and, uh, uh, and the law and something like that in one region, one country, uh, you can you can implement your service in another country and, and use that country. So uh, my 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 question is the ethical the ethical procedures, in my opinion, must be global. How to do that? This is the question. Demi, maybe you can okay. start. Okay. Uh, I, I really don't believe very much that we can have a global ethical system because the, it depends on a lot of, of things, including the local culture and so on. And it's not easy. What I, I, I recommend for intelligence, artificial intelligence uh, in the first hand is uh, I think it's it would be a very powerful tool for our lives, a very powerful tool for our lives. Uh, I have read an article these days about the, the uh, uh, divide, the design of new proteins that can be very helpful in, in some diseases, and they can do this using inter uh, artificial intelligence. My problem with that is I will not like to see the decisions in the hand of artificial intelligence 
uh, programs. I, 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 I like to see them like the, the old microscopes and the old other tools, a, a, a strong tool to make us did the decisions, but I will keep the decisions at the human's end at least for a while. Then uh, my recommendation is that is to go slowly with this, with a, a grain of salt, and uh, to keep the, the decisions uh, in our hands for, for now. Thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, Carlos, please. Well, with the risk of uh, uh, being perhaps slightly more optimist about the ability to have uh, some convergence in the international fora around this, uh, I recognize that it's still difficult because we touch very complex issues in terms of culture, in terms of values, and we don't have a, a fully universal system of values. Well, we would like to think that we have, but the reality is slightly more complex. Uh, I, I took actually with, with um, uh, building on, on, on the answer that was given by Demi, one of the things that we praise the most, for instance, in the uh, Brazilian approach to the LGPD is when we deal with the automated uh, processing systems that determine things like, for instance, credit scores, which is, was something that was extensively debated during the process because we have very tortuous ways of uh, defining if someone is a good payer or a bad payer uh, are something that actually uh, plays a, a, a let's say, a very important role, because to some extent, uh, people talk very much about the social rating systems that exist apparently in some countries, and to some extent, it's also a kind of an alter ego of that system, but more focused on the uh, uh, behavior in a more capitalist-driven society. So I think that establishing that clearly a human interventor uh, has the final word and that any citizen that is subject to the, this kind of uh, uh, rating systems or, or automated rating systems can also always invoke uh, uh, a more in-depth uh, analysis of what determines its core. I think it's something extremely important because otherwise we actually risk the situation of being uh, somehow expelled from the common... Uh, uh, digital citizenship uh, just because uh, the machine make either an intended or unintended mistake. So we think that uh, humans should always be in last resort in control, no matter how imperfect the human uh, mind is and the human nature uh, and the, the, the failures of human nature. I think it's important to preserve that, that element of, of, of safeguard. Thank you, Carlos. Now, I, I think that uh, will be the, the last question because, because the, time, uh, the time is over. And uh, I will pass the microphone to, to Stefan Salaj. Please, Stefan. Your, your microphone is muted. Yeah. Hi, everybody, and especially I'm very happy to meet uh, Professor Lourdes because I enjoy very much her studies on China and learn a lot about this. And congratulations for this meeting. I have some comments. First one is uh, we are discussing very much about the connectivity 5 and 6G, but we are forgetting what are our needs. The focus is on suppliers, focus is on government concessions in discussion is not what our society need to develop. And 5G and 6G is one of the tools for development of our society on economic, social, and so other fields. So I kindly ask you to change a little bit the focus of discussion, not to talk very much about what we China, China, Huawei, and this company over there, but what the citizen need to live better and to have uh, a higher level of of uh, uh, income and so and uh, and uh, and be more happy at least. The second point is about the Vera ask about the joy uh, jobs. Look, this is a lot of discussion, but I think the, the, the we have to, to go back to the school. 
the jobs we need, uh, the jobs will be the different, but we have to ask how will be our educational system adopted for the new reality. And this specifically in our country, nobody is working on. And regarding the jobs, we have one another problem in Brazil because I'm live, uh, I have it in my family. The best are going abroad. We have a, the best students of engineering in Brazil are in the United States, are in Europe, and even in China. So we have the immig brain immigration. And nobody is also talking about this. So this is the two, uh, two, two problems that we have. The third point is uh, this change, technological change, means, as uh, uh, Minister Carlos Oliveira explained very well, the big opportunity to development of our, uh, bu our business, the business opportunity in Brazil as well on uh, software and also hardware. By the way, everybody is talking all the time that we have this company, this company, everybody in Brazil forget that we have even Brazilian companies producing equipment and software. And this is also the big opportunity, especially if we work together in international cooperation. So uh, thank you very much. And I think the discussion is open. And Professor Monsieur is leading this discussion and USP uh, with the think tank uh, on implementation of 5G. Uh, uh, as a honest broker, uh, let's say the, to to put and to miss Professor Demi as well and other players. So thank you very much. Professor Masir, may I make a very quick comment? I hope so. Go ahead, may please. I? Sure, go ahead. Well, 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 it was just to, to say that I'm, I'm very glad with this uh, uh, intervention. I thank you very much for bringing this uh, to our attention. As a matter of fact, um, I, I didn't emphasize it enough in my presentation, but as a matter of fact, our first slide had a, a block saying, technology that works for people. I mean, let's put the things in the right proportion. Technology is worth because it uh, uh, liberates uh, creativity potential that is supposed to deliver better life conditions for people. We have seen, for instance, that during the pandemic that uh, um, sometimes the fact of having internet would make the life or die of some people. The fact that we have a remote caring system that allow, allow us to identify that a particular person was in, in a life-threatening condition allow sometimes to break the door and get that person out. Didn't work all the times. That's probably one of the things that we need to put more emphasis, how technology really changes people's life in a way that makes them um, happier, that brings their better quality of life. I think this is a, uh, of utmost importance. But also, uh, looking a little bit wider, this is not only for individuals, this is also for the society as a whole. I mean, technology has always uh, this double side. It can go for, it can work for the best, but also for the worst. And you need to develop an element of awareness of the um, negative elements, even to develop. I think that this was mentioned in a intervention this morning, an element of uh, critical thinking in people's minds. Uh, many years ago, I think it was about. Uh, 15 years ago or so, I was running a little program on the School of Tomorrow. And one of the things that we talked very much was the concept of digital literacy. And the most important concept that was coming out of it was the following. Digital literacy is not about teaching kids how to use a computer. They will discover that by themselves. It's how to make them understand what is spreading words, what is communicating through the internet, how this changes cognitive processes, all this change communication, all this changes the way people behave, not only individually, but also collectively. And I think that actually the reality has shown that we have still a lot to learn on that um, across the whole globe, because that's not an issue in Brazil or in the US, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's an issue across the world. We need to assimilate better 
the good and the bad of uh, the technologies that we are using. Apart from that, uh, I was very thankful for actually bringing our attention to to to, to this to this to this to this aspect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos Demi. Do you want to add something? Yeah. Very very simple, very short. First of all, thanking Professor Stefan for the nice comments and also the nice words of Carlos. Uh, just to add something that we have to have in mind to promote even our our technology here in Brazil and our communities. It's important to strive to have free spectrum in some chunks that you can use to develop femtocells in 5G, for example, small cells that can be developed for national industry. We don't have to uh, all, all the times to be uh, <coughs> related to the big, uh, big industries outside. Then it's important to have the, the, the free space uh, in the spectrum when you can develop technologies, national technologies, outside technologies, small technologies that can connect more people on that. And this is a way to answer uh, in a very single, simple, humble way, uh, some, some questions about the community and the, the, the Brazilian initiatives in the area. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you again. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, thank you, my friends, to this very interesting panel, very interesting questions. And uh, I want to thank you all for attending. Thank you. And uh, let's go for the next panel because we are 50 minutes late, but let's go. Thank you very much. Thank you all. It was a pleasure and an honor to be participating in this event. Thank you thank very you, much. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Uh, uh, Mancio, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much, Monsieur. Uh, so let's start we start on our new panel. Uh, the, the name of the panel is Impact of uh, the Pandemic on International Trade Policies. We have the honor to, to have here for this panel, Professor uh, Lourdes uh, Casanova. Uh, she is Director of uh, Emerging Market Institute at Cornell University and also Professor Dr. Otaviano Canuto, uh, who is a senior fellow uh, in the Global Economy and Development Program at the Brookings Institute. Institute. Uh, Professor uh, Canuto was a colleague at the Institute of International Relations. We lost him, uh, so missing you missing uh, you uh, so much at the institute professor but you know that you have uh, a very important career career so so let's start with uh, let's start with professor Ludis. is that okay for you professor canuto yes yes yeah. okay so let's Thank start you. with professor Ludis. it's an honor for having you here professor thank you very much uh, the Amancio, the honor is mine, and also to share the panel with such a great scholar, uh, now great friend, and actually have to share one anecdote. We shared another type of lockdown. He <laughs> accepted an invitation for speaking in Cornell uh, in, a, in a conference about Brazil and Latin America, so he came from Washington and actually had two speakers from Brazil. Uh, well, you were in Washington at that time. Uh, you and also another one. You were in the, best, in the best hotel at the Stadler and the other one was downtown. And then the lockdown was caused by a tremendous March uh, snowstorm. So a snowstorm in March. And we couldn't get out of the house. I was super worried, calling. No, you know what? I had the opportunity to rest a little bit. So another type of lockdown. So definitely, thank you very much. You are a better expert than me on the subject. So uh, I'm glad that I, I, I go first because I know that you know much more than me on this subject. And I, I just wanted to, and also very happy to be with Ramon Torrent, with Vera, whom I would meet much more often when I was 
where I love to travel to Europe. And when I was teaching at INSEAD before and living in France, uh, I would meet her in the European Union Mercosur chair uh, in, in, uh, at Sciences Po with many friends. So very glad for the, thank you for the invitation. Always a pleasure to speak at USP. So, uh, and actually another anecdote since we are with friends, I am right now in Bangalore in India because yesterday my daughter got married here. So uh, today is very late for me. So I also prefer to speak first because my uh, my mind is 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 all over. And and uh, anyway, so let's go. Very important subject: international trade and what is happening in this post-pandemic world. So as we all know, the uh, global trade has had been going down in the last two, three years. And of course, for obvious reasons, the pandemic has also uh, caused a, a fall in the international trade, both in international trade and investments as well. As you know, the, the foreign direct investment is going to flow, is going to fall, has fallen and is going to fall uh, this year. And probably my colleague Ed Ottaviano will uh, talk more about this subject and give us the exact figures. However, so the physical goods have gone down. The international trade of physical goods has gone down. However, the digital trade has gone up. Streaming, uh, Google, uh, then uh, Netflix, and so many other services have gone up tremendously. It has been an acceleration of the digitalization in this post-pandemic world. And this acceleration is going to be here to stay. And a very good example was education. Education had not been disrupted by technology. And guess what? I remember those days in February, March, in which all of us, I was the day of the lockdown, I was in Boston at Harvard. And I heard, I was there when the announcement was made that we were preparing a, 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 an event, a live event that has not taken place of course, and we are now organizing a couple of webinars. And I remember flying Boston because I knew that the next lockdown uh, would be in Cornell. So, uh, and I remember very clearly the next days when all of us, all of us, young and old faculty were bombarded with, uh, with messages, with uh, training sessions, because all of us had to move to Zoom, and I remember my first webinar that I was Zoom bombed. So we all learned immediately in two, three weeks, and we don't know that yet, but definitely uh, university education has been disrupted forever and will change forever. And for sure, uh, for sure, this will uh, have tremendous consequences. So then also, uh, we are talking now about data economy. This has been, uh, and also uh, another thing that is happening is that this fall of international trade, of physical goods of international trade, remains to be seen, but may affect innovation. Innovation uh, thrives with uh, exchange of ideas, with exchange of people. I am. I have now the privilege to be at Cornell for the last. Uh, almost nine years, and uh, one of those Ivy Leagues, and you can see how these universities are ecosystems of knowledge, ecosystems of innovation, and now we are seeing how we teach, and many students are in, in Beijing, in, in India, in Brazil, because the, 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 it was impossible to fly from Brazil to, uh, besides the fact that the embassies were closed, so the students who were accepted, even those who were accepted, could not travel. So yes, uh, digitalization has allowed us to teach those students, but at the same time, all these exchanges, all these dropping by the office and talking about different things uh, that are definitely a way to incubate ideas, this is not there. So we don't know how this will affect uh, innovation in, uh, in the long uh, and medium term. 
At the same time, we have seen growth in regionalization and two recent trade agreements prove that. Okay, we had already this Belt and Road Initiative from China that was a regionalization of sorts, but in the last year, two very important agreements had been signed. African Trade Agreement, basically all African, uh, all African uh, countries have signed this agreement, very important for the continent. The continent, six of the 10 uh, highest growth countries in the world were in, uh, were in Africa in the last 10 years, of course, from a very low base, but definitely, definitely very important trade agreement that is optimistic. And even now, uh, a few weeks back, Nigeria ratified this agreement. But most importantly, RCEP, the trade agreement in Asia, in, in full pandemic, we were, it took us, many of us, many of us supposedly experts on this field, took us by surprise. It's not only that friends and, I wouldn't say enemies, but definitely not the best of friends, signed the agreement. So uh, countries like Japan and Korea that are close allies to the US signed in Australia, signed the agreement. And also those countries in Southeast Asia where they were more friendly already with China. This was China led mainly. So uh, it's not only the fact that the trade agreement was signed, but also the sign the, the, the agreement, uh, the, the sign, this agreement uh, sent to the world. So China saying, Asia saying, we want to look forward. To want, we want to look at the post-pandemic world. And even if global trade, global physical trade is falling, we want to trade more among ourselves. So definitely a very important agreement. And definitely uh, in this regionalization, we have also seen a number of new multilaterals being, being sent. And now we have uh, the new development bank led by a Brazilian, a tremendous colleague and friend, uh, Marco Stroyo, that is bringing a new energy and new ideas to these, uh, to these banks that are more than regional. They pretend to be global, but definitely, uh, definitely different from what we are used to be not US-led, not European Union-led, but emerging markets-led. So in this, also we see the world ups, upside down. We see also a world that emerging markets are taking initiatives. So then we see a rise of multilateralism of another kind, which is interesting. Again, as I mentioned, a multilateralism in which not always, definitely the New Development Bank is one of those, not one of those that are uh, led as we used to be by the US and the European Union. At the same time, let's don't forget, and, and this was mentioned a couple of times in the previous panel, the US-China trade war definitely very important, that is leading the world to different standards. So again, we, if we look at 5G, 6G, mentioned in the previous panel, and I'm not going to extend myself, but it's not only this, this launch of these different, uh, these different uh, standards, but also countries like Brazil, and again, that was, that occupied a, a, part of the discussion in the previous panel, countries like Brazil or European countries are called by the US to choose. You have to choose one or the other technology. Let's forget about safety issues, but why Brazil has to find itself choosing under pressure one or another technology. But also Baidu, the, the new G, Chinese GPS, that is now in 160 countries. So again, which te we were used to technologies that GPS, everybody GPS. And guess what? With this new satellite launched by China, this Baidu in a few months is now adopted by 165 countries. So again, 
these different standards dividing the world. I said digitalization is somehow uniting, but definitely these different standards may uh, change the world. And also, I wanted to mention another technology, and I wanted to mention a state grid corporation with great investments in Brazil during the pandemic a few weeks ago, bought the Naturgy in Chile. I'm from Spain. Uh, Naturgy is a Spanish electricity company, Union Fenosa, and a state grid corporation during this pandemic two, three weeks ago, bought this company, a major investment in Chile. So again, talking about the standards, a state grid corporation, if you look where they invest, they are launching what they call JCO. JCO is the worldwide grid. So we have the worldwide uh, web, so the worldwide grid. In a moment in which everybody was moving to solar, to renewables, to uh, wind energy, a state grid, and, and China with this initiative is saying, you know what? Let's don't forget about transmission, electricity transmission. And let's connect the grids, which will allow us for a better usage of different sources of energy. So if you have a huge wind farm somewhere or a huge solar panel farm, if we can call it, in a desert, if it's connected to the grid, we can use the ups and downs of uh, electricity generation and connect the world. So again, another technology, and also why they can do it, because they have an innovation that is reducing the amount of electricity that is lost in transmission using high voltages. This is, an, uh, this is a, a, a technology that was first launched in Europe, but was not used extensively, and a state grid corporation is using it all over the world, and definitely they are buying assets in different countries because that's their project, medium term, long term. Again, are you part of JITCO? Are you not part? Concerns about sovereign uh, technology, concerns about security, concerns about, and, and again, cybersecurity was mentioned in the previous panel. So again, forces that could bring us together and at the same time separated. This technology about and this project is less well known and that's why it has not been too controversial yet as the case of uh, 5G and 6G has been, is all in the open, but will come, the discussion will come later. And again, behind all this is the rise of China, of course, and we were used to a US leadership that was very strong, that was their weight in all multilateral organizations was very important, and we see US uh, leadership being questioned in certain aspects and the US reacting very strongly and has been also mentioned in the previous panels, the possible changes with the new Biden administration. But my opinion, and I've been asked a number of times in the last weeks about that, my opinion is that one thing in the new administration will not change. And we have seen the first statements uh, in this direction, is this controversy, is this fight between US and China. This is going to continue because the US, for the first time, sees its economic and business power and innovation power being threatened by the rise of another country that is China. So, and I can see that, I, I can see that in these years that I've lived in the US, that I teach in the US, this, uh, this animosity is growing and definitely this will have tremendous implications in, uh, in trade and investments. And countries like Brazil, with the, uh, during the pandemic, the trade with China and other emerging markets has grown, where investments from China have, have continued. So a country like Brazil will be called to position itself. And Europe definitely 
is being pressured to take a decision regarding different uh, technologies and uh, different standards. So that's very important. And I will leave it into that and pass the word to my uh, the person I admire a lot and has done a tremendous work in this subject, that is Ottaviano Canuto, and knows much more than I do on this. Well, thank you very much, Lourdes, please, uh, Canuto, you have the floor. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Amancio, for having me here. It's really a great pleasure, at least to meet virtually Lourdes. I know that is there as well. And, uh, and, and, and also a pleasure to kind of a return home because, uh, as, as Professor Amancio mentioned, the, uh, the, I was a professor of macroeconomics for the first class of uh, undergraduates. Uh, on international relations at the University of Sao Paulo. So I'm coming back in, to some extent, even if virtually. And uh, after uh, uh, 18 years, uh, including 15 at multilateral institutions, uh, working at the World Bank, IDB, and, and IMF, I'm now returning to the classroom, even if virtually. I'm going to give a course at Columbia in the spring and also another one at George Washington University. Uh, so great. Uh, see, I, I share uh, Ludi's, Professor Ludi's uh, view of the future had uh, something mixed. Uh, we have a, a blended picture. Uh, but to a large extent, I guess, I do believe that uh, the pandemic is accelerating history in the sense that it's speeding up some recent trends. And in a nutshell, the pandemic will not reverse globalization, but it will reshape it. And that's the, the major point that I want to lay out. In order to get there, I will take three steps. First, uh, I will complement uh, Professor Ludi's presentation. I will try to uh, by uh, giving us a bird's eye view on, on global trade during the pandemic. Then I will, uh, as a second step, put it in perspective relative to, to prior trends. And finally, I will try to gauge uh, how global value chain managers and governments, which is uh, obviously uh, 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 important, the major topic of our discussion, are likely to react to, to them, to those two points. So let me uh, uh, start with uh, the recent evolution of trade. See, as Professor Ludis highlighted quite well, we had a, a profound decline of uh, trade during the, uh, the pandemic. Normal activities were disrupted by lockdowns and travel restrictions which remained in place particularly in most countries throughout April and May before being partially scaled back in June. And uh, some preliminary data uh, as depicted in the chart show signs of trade and GDP rebounding in the third quarter of uh, 2020, following the relaxation of uh, those social distancing measures. On average, just to put some figures, trade was down uh, 10.2 percent in the first half of the year, as compared to 2019. And despite signs of a turnaround in June, uh, trade fell 14.3 percent in the second quarter over the previous period, making it the largest one-quarter decline on record. So overall, the trade impact of the pandemic is comparable in size to the financial crisis, the global financial crisis, although the crisis, the current crisis is of a different nature. Uh, the, uh, the chart shows the latest WTO trade forecast that was released on 6th of October, uh, uh, where uh, a 9.2% drop in the volume of world merchandise trade in 2020 is to be followed by a 7.2% increase next year. So clearly, merchandise trade is still to remain well below its previous trajectory. 
Trade growth is expected to slow in the ongoing fourth quarter and beyond uh, as countries face new waves of contamination. In fact, the actual performance of trade was slightly better than forecast in the middle of the year, but the strength of the recovery is still uncertain and trade will remain vulnerable to setbacks as long as the pandemic persists. Many countries are already experience second waves of infection, prompting governments to consider stricter rules and confinement measures that could eventually weigh on trade. We are seeing a race between vaccines and COVID-19, and it is still on. The decline in world merchandise trade in the first half of 2020 was smaller than expected, but the fall in, in world GDP was larger. Uh, and uh, of course, the uh, forecasts about uh, trade like GDP are all, let's say, pending on, on, on uh, confirmation. It is particularly uncertain. Now, uh, something quite important, larger declines were recorded for commercial service trade, even larger than merchandise trade. Commercial service exports were down 30% in the second quarter, or 18% for the year up to September. Of course, this is not the case of uh, the kind of virtual service, uh, the cross-border virtual service that Professor Lu did allude to. But of course, uh, many other uh, services, including tourism, of course, uh, was uh, suffered the impact of the, uh, the COVID-19. The magnitude of the decline in service trade contrasts with the, the one of previous global recessions, when service trade tended to be less volatile than merchandise trade, for obvious reasons. Now, uh, typically in normal recessions, the manufacturing sector uh, felt uh, a, a great impact, whereas this time the case of impact is on service, on, on, on uh, uh, let's say, on service, uh, that uh, demand uh, physical proximity to consumers, including uh, the ones vulnerable to social distancing measures and particularly travel restrictions. Uh, the trade slump hit countries in all regions and at all levels of development, although some were more affected than others. Asia in particular recorded smaller trade declines than other regions. And this may be partly explained by the combination of proactive fiscal policies adopted in other regions, by uh, in the US, Europe, and, and, and Latin America, which have allowed consumers to maintain a relatively high level of consumption during the crisis. This would tend to stimulate exports from Asian economies, since these countries are major producers of goods for which demand remained strong during the pandemic, including electronics and medical supplies. Uh, something interesting as well to take into account is the evolution of commodity price. I am among those that uh, uh, spoke about a perfect storm in developing economies coming with the coronavirus. Besides the COVID shock and all the difficulties that developing countries we're bound to face to cope, both on the infection side and on, on uh, fighting the recession. Uh, there were two, uh, three other, other types of shocks, shocks from abroad. The financial shock in March, which was, uh, let's say, uh, uh, normalized after the, the central bank's reactions of developing countries, of developed countries. Tourism, this was uh, down the hill, of course, but also remittance and commodities. In remittance, interestingly, we have seen recent figures showing that the downfall was not as bad as expected by many institutions, including the, the World Bank. And on the, in the case of commodities, uh, of course, the price for primary commodities other than metals fell in the second quarter, as you can see, uh, with the price of fuels declining most, around 50% year on year, but they have partially recovered since then. Food prices were down 3% over the same period. In some cases, uh, they, they stayed uh, at the previous levels when not increasing. 
Uh, Look, I cannot see your slides. It is frozen somewhere. Oh, oh. Ah, oh. better now, better now, better now. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I was uh, using the chart to show the, the different behaviors of different types of commodities, but even oil has partially recovered, uh, and and uh, and and food stuff has remained uh, reasonably well. Now uh, let me uh, let's say move on to my second point, which is the considerations about structural trends. That is to say, look, yeah. Tell me. Let, 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 let me know which slide you want to. I I, I present. Is is that one? What where is which one? The one that that has the global. The next trend. one. The next, the next one. The this one for the. This moment, one. Yeah. No, this the one? previous one. The previous one. Uh, this one. No, after this, I, the, I, I, yes, this one. This one is good. Great, fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, where I was to say something about the trends prevailing prior to COVID. Uh, this chart is very much telling because it, it exhibits how the world trade volumes have lagged behind GDP growth since the 2000s, uh, a trend that was accentuated after the onset of the global financial crisis. Uh, uh, some transitional and therefore potentially reversible factors may be pointed out, but some structural trends have also been at play and they matter for our discussion here. Uh, which transitional factors? Uh, we have seen that the weak recovery of fixed investments in advanced economies since the global financial crisis has suppressed an important source of trade volume given the higher than average cross-border exchange that characterized fixed investment goods. But there are also structural factors. Clearly, the glorious era of uh, globalization 2.0 associated with the rise of global value chains clearly peaked by 2008, as you can see in the chart. In the 2010s, after the global financial crisis, trade stagnated as a share of GDP. And, and as uh, uh, Professor Lewis has also mentioned, uh, the foreign direct investment fell uh, since the crisis. This is a well-known story, uh, but it, it's worth maybe uh, encapsulating it uh, again. We know that trade opening measures integrating areas with cheap labor into global markets, China and others in Asia, but also Eastern Europe for, for Europe and Mexico. Plus, together with uh, technological breakthroughs on transportation, containers for instance, and information and communication technologies allowed a fragmentation of production processes in their geographical dispersion. And after steadily increasing between the mid 80s and the mid 2000s, the trade elasticity to GDP lost steam. After jumping in previous decades, the world's export to GDP ratio seems to have started to approach some plateau, the so-called peak trade that you can see in the chart. Since 2008, world trade has been rising slower than GDP and leading to a fall in the share of exports in global GDP. However, even if transitional post-global financial price factors were partially reversed, the presence of a long-term trajectory of trade elasticity displaying a slowdown already prior to the recent pattern uh, would suggest that we are not facing an automatic return to the heyday. Which structural trends would be those? Uh, they matter for our discussion. To some extent, uh, fully from, from, from being uh, complete, uh, manufacturing is becoming more automated. Savings from location production where workers were cheapest start to shrink. Also, we have, you know, phenomena like the rise of social media making consumer fads more volatile, necessitating faster production and shipment to satisfy impatient buyers. Just-in-time delivery of parts work better with closer supplies. And as we discussed previously, Digitalization tends to speed those in the case of manufacturing. Second structural factor 
that first major wave of vertical and spatial fragmentation of production has passed. It was completed in, in mechanics and electronics. Third, uh, a major wave of trade come structural transformation has passed. China as a special case. China's rebalancing, that is to say, going up the ladder in global value chains, gradually lifting the domestic consumption ratio in, in GDP, and, and, and the higher GDP share per service. This is happening uh, maybe uh, not so fast, but, it, but it's a trend. And as China's middle class is growing, it's been consuming domestically more of what it produced. That's why China's share of world exports stopped rising in 2015, uh, but its share of world imports continue to grow. A fourth structural factor that is worth uh, uh, stressing on is the fact that the advanced economies are becoming service economies. And uh, as of today, yet service economies uh, have displayed a lower uh, elast trade elasticity as compared to manufacturing. Uh, it's important to highlight as well uh, how some disasters, high, uh, you know, call attention to the risk of having too much dependence on single links. Uh, I think of the, the way the tsunami hit Japan in 2011, and that cut Toyota's production in America by nearly a third because of a shortage of ports. We also had the flooding in Thailand, inundating factors that then produced a quarter of the world's hard drives. So firms, began to see long supply chains as unwieldy and risky. And it's not by chance that in some cases, trade started to concentrate in regional blocks. Also, and this is quite important, rising murky trade restrictive tax come subsidy policy measures have been adopted, were adopted in some key sectors by some countries. And, uh, and they may have become more significant than what is usually perceived. We'll see that in the next slide in a minute. Uh, also take into account that in the 2010s, no new and deeper multilateral trade deals happened. They stalled. We even had the UK voting Brexit and the US renegotiating existing trade treaties and relationships. Uh, as Professor Lewis highlighted, the tariff wars involving the US and major trade partners, particularly China, contributed to a significant shift in US import sources. US imports from China declined in nearly all major industry categories last year, most dramatically in energy sectors, semiconductors, machinery, and packaged foods, and rose in most sectors in trade with the EU, Japan, South Korea, India, Southeast Asia, and Turkey. Uh, and the COVID-19 crisis has also uh, brought a further blow to trade. I'm not talking about the impact of uh, GDP decline on trade. I'm talking about that trade was constrained by actions taken to control the virus, such as the lockdowns of factories and controls on shipments at ports, as well as we saw, we watched the export bans uh, on certain medical and agri-food products imposed by several governments and custom unions. Professor Amancio, could you please move to the next slide? So many long-standing downside risks are now being faced by, uh, you know, are affecting the global trade outlook. Okay, we had, as, as Louis highlighted quite well, uh, some, some positive uh, news regarding trade. Well, we had the US-China phase one agreement signed early this year. We had some recent free trade agreements between the European Union and some Asian partners and even Mercosur, uh, <laughs> hoping that it goes for what. And we had, but we had interestingly, a recent increase in trade facilitating measures. You can see that in the chart that I took from the WTO. You had, of course, the uh, trade measures, non-related to, to, to COVID, but also you have a couple of, uh, of uh, trade facilitation measures. Uh, and, and of course, the major example of how things 
are mixed uh, uh, is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RECEP, uh, signed by China, Japan, Korea, Australia, the Asian countries in New Zealand uh, that uh, Professor Casanova highlighted quite well. They, they are not, the RECEP is not uh, dealing, as ambitious in dealing with rules and standards like the, uh, TTIP, the TPP and the TTIP were, but at least uh, it, it will reduce tariffs on trade for goods, it will expand market access for some service, and will unify rules of origin within the block. Even so, some of the distortionary barriers to trade depicted in the chart introduced around the world over the past two years are still in place. Tariff and non-tariff barriers remain high and continue to limit global trade. Uh, uh, not to mention uh, the, the, the fact that we don't have the World Trade Organization's appellate body, uh, which has ceased to function while waiting for the appointment of a uh, uh, new member's board and so on. But uh, let me highlight the additional downside risks to this picture brought by the COVID-19 outbreak. I have mentioned how many countries reacted in the early phase of the pandemic by tightening trade restrictions, for example, on medical supplies, particularly in Europe and North America. Uh, many of these restrictions were temporary and they were lifted quickly because they were running against the interests of those who, uh, who uh, applied them. Uh, but uh, in the event of a substantial weakening in the recovery with a new surge in global demand for medical supplies, uh, a risk that is that such restrictions could be reintroduced. Uh, also, the disruptions and shortage for a few but essential products have revived discussions about the costs of the international fragmentation of production. Reductions in trade dependency, including repatriating production, are seen as a potential way of reducing risk. But, 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 and this is important, but, could also impose substantial efficiency costs, which, let's say, dims the prospects of having any kind of a, a full revival of protectionism. Uh, but it's true that for some goods considered as essential, the policymakers uh, can alternatively improve risk preparedness by monitoring the concentration of supply sources and increasing stockpiles. Let me move now to my third point, which is on the uh, the the, the uh, likely implications uh, and so on. Could I, uh, Professor? Can I have the uh, yes? Good, thank you. Uh, see, regardless of when the top line numbers of trade fully recover. The global trade landscape will look likely dramatically different as companies shift their focus from coping with the pandemic to winning the post-COVID-19 future. And as governments implement policies that they have signaled they will adopt. As the pandemic destabilizes economies, intensifies geopolitical frictions, and expose the risks of current global manufacturing and supply networks. So it is also likely to redraw the map of world trade. Let me give you uh, four educated guesses uh, about uh, the, the, the next uh, decade or so. Uh, the two-way trade between US and China will keep shrinking, uh, even if uh, uh, Mr. Biden does not adopt the uh, Trump style of tariff wars. Trade between the United States and the European Union will continue to grow, but at a sharply lower rate than the surge that took place from 2015 until last year. Third, also uh, my educated guess is that the, the European Union trade with China will decline uh, after growing uh, in the previous four year period. We, the European Union trade with India and South America will flatten as well. And fourth, Southeast Asia will continue to be one of the strongest gainers, increasing two-way trade by around 
I, I saw that in a report uh, prepared by the Boston Consulting Group, something like $22 billion with the European Union, $26 billion with the US, and $41 billion with China by, by the end of 2013, 20, 20, 20, 2023. Uh, but still, this is at a slower pace than uh, the earlier four-year period. Um, companies will be, as I said, naturally to revise at least to, to relook the mix of products and the design of uh, their global supply chains uh, to adapt to these and other shifts. Uh, and governments will revise their trade economic policies. I, uh, Mr. Macron uh, declared that uh, the line of strategic sectors would be reviewed, that is to say, uh, the scope of uh, concern with uh, the maintenance of local production will go beyond whatever uh, France has now. Uh, and we, one can guess that this is likely the case with uh, medical equipment, biopharmaceutical products, semiconductors, and the consumer electronics. These are particularly exposed to geopolitical and macroeconomic pressures. In their other ways, COVID-19 is also transforming trade. The, the pandemic has had a positive spillover effect on the climate change agenda. Green recovery is the buzzword. Uh, those of us who accompany a bit, for instance, the, uh, the evolution of, 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 of funds, I myself have been impressed with uh, the way by which green funds, in fact, broader, uh, the ESG funds have grown, have received resource. The, the millennials are more sensitive to that. And, uh, and the fact is that, you know, instead of uh, for sharing or putting a, putting a shadow on climate change, the COVID-19 has highlighted it. And uh, it may well be the case that the European Green Deal strategy will end up slashing in order to slash greenhouse gas emissions, they will, the European Commission will press ahead with a proposal to impose carbon tax on imports. And this tax could redefine global competitiveness in a range of industries. We have to look at that as Brazilians. We have to keep that in mind. And also the geopolitical friction. Uh, because one way or another, that's one of the, the trends that were there, that COVID, at least for the time being, is accelerating, is a trend toward nationalist policies and managed trade. In addition to worsening the US-China relationships, the pandemic is prompting some governments and custom unions to place further controls on trade in medical and agricultural goods. Uh, and China itself, it's impressive how China in the last few uh, months has signaled uh, diversification of sources of agricultural products, soybeans being produced in the Republic of Tatarstan in Russia, which, by the way, when I visited it in back in 2006, I was part of a mission, and uh, the prime, the 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 the, uh, the president of the Republic of Tatarstan called me apart, 2006, to say that they wanted links with Brazil. Uh, because they were thinking of developing soybeans production in Tatarstan, and we are watching it now, 14 years later. It's impressive the uh, the way by which uh, uh, the more than 80 countries imposed export bans on medical devices and personal protective equipment, and in uh, the Eurasian Economic Union, to include them as well in, in, the, in the group, which includes Russia banned certain agricultural staples, uh, did nations. Uh, Vietnam and Cambodia also did as well. Uh, uh, it's important to keep in mind that the supply chain face trade-offs. It's not a, a done deal. Okay, let's make our supply chains more resilient, so let's bring everything back home, because this neither eliminates the risks of exposure to shocks, so keeping diversified supply chains would be the way for that. And there is a cost in terms of uh, in terms of uh, of cost because the supply chain, the global supply chains, do not exist by chance. They exist because they minimize uh, uh, costs. 
So, uh, last, last slide, Professor. Uh, my, my uh, let's say, my takeaways, the ways that, that I propose. By intensifying geopolitical and economic force already at work, as we saw, the pandemic's disruptive impact on international trade will leave a lasting mark. Uh, countervailed partially by the good news, the few good news that we saw. The pandemic, second, is adding some urgency to efforts to restructure global supply chains. As I said, companies seek to make their manufacturing and procurement networks more resilient to shocks. Third, it's exacerbating the deteriorating US-China trade relationship and especially in industries in both economies that will have a hard time replacing lost revenue and source of critical components and materials. And, and, and China has embraced this uh, by not, uh, not by chance that the, the buzzword in China is the, uh, the dual circulation, the double circulation. So uh, putting an emphasis on the, the domestic circulation uh, to not to be so dependent from abroad. Uh, another topic, another uh, conclusion that was addressed in the previous panel is the possibility of uh, the coupling of U.S. and Chinese technology sectors, including making devices and IT systems in both markets no longer interoperable. And this might have greater repercussions. So to be seen. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Professor. So I will open the floor for uh, questions for both Professor Lourdes and Professor Canuto after this uh, uh, amazing uh, presentation. Please, uh, you can raise the hand and, uh, hand and open the micro. Um, Marcia, I believe there are two questions in Q&A. Uh, yes, uh, let's start with Professor Vera. Vera Professor Vera Tortoise cannot stand it to, to, stay, so to stay silent. So, so go ahead, Professor. I, I am quite rapid to shoot. Uh, Professor Canut, it's a pleasure to, be, to see you, Lourdes, again. Um, for, for both of you, how are your bets? that, uh, uh, that uh, the TPPU research from the, from the, 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 I don't know, from the clouds again. Uh, second, how European Union can, in the sense, how to deal with the US. And third, uh, what are the, the chance of uh, uh, TPP 11 or 12 or something like that? So, to see the blocks, you know, United States, what the United States is going to do, European Union, can the European Union now, because of this morning, Canuto, I, I, I talk a, a, a lot of integration, and, and then I said that for me, RISEP is a kind of atomic bomb in trade area, because it's going to force, and I agree with you, it's only about tariff and rules of origin, nothing else. I read the 15,000 pages, it's awful. But uh, for me, this is going to, to change all the, the game of trade. And so my, my idea is what's going to happen with the US, TPP? I don't know. What's going to be happen with the European Union? For me, this is important. And then poor Brazil and Latin America, you are completely out of this new game of trade. So please, right. speculations. Do this. OK. So a couple of things. One, uh, President-elect Biden has already said that he's not going to sign any trade agreement unless there are two things, that the average American benefits from it and the other one, I don't remember. <laughs> so anyway, 
He has zero and intention. Workers, workers, workers. Exactly, in the US. exactly, workers, yeah. So, anyway, this is to say that there is a zero intention by the new administration to sign any trade agreement in the short term. Okay, again, I would like to, I like, to, so to be seen, to be seen, a, a new government, you never know, but that's the intention as of now. Also, as I said, I lived in the US many times before. I lived when I was a student, when I was a Fulbright student, when I taught at UC Berkeley for three years, and now. And let me tell you, the President Trump has done one thing, has changed the country. <laughs> so then, and then that leads me to my second question, the European Union. So I, again, I've been in a couple of panels on this subject. And I'm from Spain, so I've been in quite a few panels, experts, opinions, European Union. So a couple of things. One is that Europe was taken by surprise by the aggressivity of President Trump. And then, like, Europe, again, remains to be seen, but Europe thinks, and, and that is Germany. Germany is a very strong power in Europe. And, uh, and I would say has been a strong power before, but now you feel it. So then, uh, and, and then definitely the, the reaction of, the, of, of uh, Germany was, what is happening here? So, and now there is some mistrust. What about, so we, we okay, the, 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 let's say the European Union, US Entente Cordiale was based on trust as many relations at all levels. So then the European Union is saying, what about if after President Biden arrives another president who again brings back this rhetoric? So then this mistrust and what happened with President Trump has tremendous implications in security and trade and everything. Okay, again, the European Union is again, it has been that way quite closed as a trade group. 70% of the, of, the, of the trade in the European Union is intra-trade. So uh, my opinion is that uh, uh, the European Union will, is welcoming everybody, uh, everybody, many, okay, half the country in the US or, well, or, or those who voted for President-elect Trump in Europe had a sign of relief but at the same time, as I said, the mistrust that they started with the previous uh, administration is here to stay. It's, I wonder if this will go back to before. And again, I don't anticipate. Again, I I um, I, I agree with many of the of the things that uh, well with everything that uh, uh, Ottaviano Canuto said. My opinion is that the tariffs and, 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 and the European Union, again, looking inside and uh, US looking inside more than outside, is here to stay. So the globalization is going to be emerging markets led. And it's going to, uh, again, China uh, is leading this new era of globalization. Great. Uh, if, if I agree with uh, with, with Ludis. Uh, uh, Vera, uh, it's true that I, I don't see Biden eager to take any stance uh, such as, oh, let's free trade and so on. But, 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 but the social and environment agenda that was part of the intention behind the, T uh, the TPP could be relived. Uh, and that would be very much, let's say, uh, seen and taken as of interest to the U.S. workers and so on, particularly, and also by, by a, a, a strong component of the support that, you know, after all, he was elected with knowing that the, uh, the country would march in that direction. We know that originally, to, you know, better than, than, than I do, how... Uh, originally, the TPP was 
uh, seen as a, a competent way, as a possible way to engage China, to, to, uh, to frame China, right? Uh, with a broader agenda, including the uh, uh, bankruptcy laws, uh, rules of, of the game, uh, acknowledgement of intellectual property, and so on. And, and, and interestingly, uh, the, the retrocess uh, coming with uh, the failed Mr. Trump's attempt, it's impressive. I, uh, I even wrote about this uh, uh, using a study done by two economists from the Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, they, well, I, I, they showed, the, those economists, that the, the tariff war by Trump hurt the U.S. manufacturing industry. When one takes into account the, the impact of the tariffs on the users of uh, intermediate products, as well as when one reckons the retaliatory actions taken by others, the U.S. manufacturing industry got hurt. Uh, uh, not to speak of the agriculture, which suffered the, the, the shock from, from the Chinese block. And it's not by chance, I believe, that Trump did not speak about his trade success uh, during the campaign. He mentioned China as the virus, vir the Chinese virus. He referred to human rights and Hong Kong, but never about trade because it was a disaster. Even the components of the, the, uh, the phase one agreement, uh, they were retrocessed. China had already a bankruptcy law in place and they suspended the law during the, the, <laughs> the war. And, but it, it, it was in the interest of China uh, to strengthen, they are doing this now. Some of the pins that support, let's say, a uh, closer to market economy functioning. It's true that Xi Jinping slowed the pace of the rebalancing between the public and private sectors. But at the same time, we have seen how the agenda is still there and they're moving there. So uh, uh, China would make the institutions uh, in, internally in China without losing the grip uh, of the publics of the party on the on the major firms, but it's still the agenda that was aimed at will will keep pace, will will move ahead. Uh, definitely, I agree that Biden will not be proactive in 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 the Trump's style, but but trying to to circle China by enhancing the, the, the links with the European Union will also be, uh, will be very much uh, uh, close to, to the agenda that he looks for, including possible agreements, if not on tariffs. Uh, but uh, if, you, if you connect the trade agreement with other measures that might, let's say, reach the target of, 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 of uh, pressing China. Uh, one unknown, and I'm, I'm dying to, to hear comments, and I keep talking to my friends at the World Bank and, and people in China. I was in China early this morning, virtually, of course, mm -hmm. participating in a, in a seminar there. Is the future of the Belt and Road. Mm -hmm. uh, Belt and Road was a win-win for China, for the recipient countries of the investment and so on, connecting trade in both ways, making China uh, uh, play the role of core in a, a revival of the globalization 2.0, both ways. But obviously, uh, the European market as the destination is, a, is, is an important component of the trajectory. The enthusiasm with the Belt and Road is so huge. My last, one of my last missions at the World Bank was to, to uh, Belarus and, and to, to uh, Georgia. And the enthusiasm of the guys there with the Belt and Road was incredible to my eyes. Of course, they see themselves, you know, well, it's the, the old Belt and Road back and we are here. And of course, with it, it will come the uh, geopolitical influence of, 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 uh, of power of China. Uh, maybe they will try to connect it with their telecommunications agenda as well. Maybe digital payments and so on. But it will depend a lot on how the European Union will react to that, uh, even more than the, the accusations coming from Washington. So in a nutshell, uh, 
Mr. Biden will not return, even if Trump was reelected, I doubt he would return to his tactics. Uh, well, he, he succeeded because of Mexico, putting the Mexicans to hold the refugees down the, the south of the border. Uh, he treasured a bit of the automobile industry back to the U.S. with the new NAFTA, to, in detriment, to the detriment of the automobiles produced in the U.S., of course, uh, and, and, and exported. But overall, uh, the trade war, tariff trade wars were unsuccessful. Uh, so Biden will not, re, will not get that. Uh, but the, the, the other remainder of the agenda, which is not related to directly to, to, to tariffs or associating with tariffs only to the extent that it's possible, I guess Biden will, will pursue. Just to add another data point, since November 2019, Mexico has become the biggest trade partner of the U.S. So clearly there is, there is, a, I wouldn't say success, but definitely a, this has happened. Just another, a, so what has happened with President Trump is that he has got along extremely well with the President of Mexico. And there are in the, uh, the, the, the Black Monday, uh, when, when the oil price went uh, into negative uh, and this uh, OPEC meeting took place, um, Mexico, the AMLO, did not want to reduce the production of oil. And Trump offered and did, don't worry, I'll do the, 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 the reductions that you have to do in oil exports, I'll do it myself. So yes, uh, okay, we don't know what is, okay, many of the, of the hidden uh, agreements, but definitely uh, Mexico has again regained the position of number one trade partner to the US that had before, which is interesting. Then and regarding the Belt and Road Initiative, I think before was like, a, okay, it, it was like the Monroe, the equivalent of the Monroe uh, doctrine. So saying, okay, the backyard is mine somehow. But now I think it's more of a metaphor. It's more than of a net metaphor of, of asserting China's influence in natural market and beyond. And yes, China was seen, and that was clearly Latin America, from a savior. China is more like us. China will not act like the US or European Union. It's one of us. And they are going to be softer in their investments. Of course not. China looks for the good of the, of the Chinese citizens that there are many, 1.2 billion. And it's not coming to Brazil to save Brazil. It's coming to Brazil to save China, for sure. And having said that, one place is Africa. I, and I've been in a couple of webinars or quite a few webinars regarding this issue. And what I hear is that, okay, from savior, so from, from the angel to devil. And now China, and I would say Brazil as well, is having a more pragmatic view. We need FDI, so why not from China? Also, another data point is that China did not blink during last recession in 2008. Kept growing 10%, 11%. And because of this tremendous growth, pulled emerging markets. And a case in point in Brazil. In Brazil, the recession in the 2008 was minimal because of the pull from China. Will this time do the same? Of course, it's a weaker China, but... The latest forecast is that between 2020 and 2011, China will grow 11%, i.e. about 5% or maybe 4% this year, 6% next year. And having said that, I'm going to give you another data point. China today is the size of the economy of US GDP nominal 2004. That was pre-crisis. That was a wonderful year for the U.S. economy, a wonderful year, and the economy grew 3%. And now we say that Chinese economy is slowing down. Of course, because the size of the economy will slow down. But if we look in absolute terms, 5% of growth of China today 
is in absolute terms more than 10% of growth in uh, well, 10 years ago because the economy was smaller. So putting those in perspective, I believe China is here to stay. And for Brazil, Brazil is a battleground. And China has a medium-sized, long-sized economy. So my message to Latin America today, to Brazil today, please learn from regionalization in Africa, regionalization in Asia. And guess what, as I, as I heard from a Brazilian ambassador who spoke in my class and said, you know what is the art of politics? Is to try again what has been tried forever and has been failed a number of times. Latin America, South America mainly because Mexico is married to the US, South America needs urgently, Vera and those of you who have been such a, so vocal into that, South America needs urgently a trade agreement, urgently, because the world is becoming more regional. And because Brazil cannot negotiate with China, South America maybe could, but Brazil is too small of an economy to negotiate with China and needs to negotiate with China and needs to have policies medium term and long term like China has. And I hope that Benedese, that was again off, on and off, on and off, development banks are back in fashion. Chinese development cannot be explained unless with the help of the development banks. I really hope that there is a rethink of the role of BNDES in Brazil, guess what, needs to keep BNDES, a better BNDES, not corruption, no nothing, no, needs that, and many other things. Well, uh, it seems that uh, 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 U.S. is losing influence in, in Latin America and China is increasing this influence. I can't understand why U.S. Uh, don't react on that. It happens on, on Africa, but uh, in Latin America, what, what, what is the position of U.S. in this uh, context? So I will open the, the, the floor. I don't know if it's someone wants to add some question. Eduardo Viola, yes, do you, yeah. do, Viola, do you want to add yeah, some questions? Yeah, just a, a quick question. No, I mean, for, I mean, first of all, thank you very much for, uh, to both for an excellent presentation. I was very impacted, particularly by Ottaviano Canuto presentation. There is something, Ottaviano, that you uh, mentioned very fast about the decoupling, the possible, the possible decoupling between the United States and China. And my question is, could you elaborate a little bit about this? First of all, uh, the decoupling will be in all high-tech sectors or just some of them. Second one, which uh, sectors of the American corporation uh, American corporate world and the American foreign policy and defense elites all are in favor of the capital. Okay, great. Let let me go first, uh, uh, Louis. Uh, look, uh, definitely telecommunications is already a battleground, uh, and it came uh, before uh, China expected, probably. Uh, Huawei confessed that the impact of being cut off from access to Google platforms was very harmful. Uh, uh, the, the Huawei was developing an alternative, the eHarmony and so on, uh, but, uh, but uh, and it, it felt the impact of the US trade sanctions and also TikTok and, and obviously. But uh, there is so much at stake in telecommunications, in terms of securities, in terms of uh, connections to, to, to military power, that definitely it will be a battleground where the security issues will remain at the fore. And there is another implication, uh, a likely one, uh, that I, that I, I can't claim to, to, to know in depth, but, uh, but my intuition, show us clearly, which is the following. 
digital banking. Look, uh, the power that the US has to establish sanctions, the sanctions on Venezuela, sanctions on, on Iran, sanctions on North Korea, sanctions on, on, on dirty money, uh, uh, they are only made possible because of the interconnectedness of the banking system uh, based on SWIFT. SWIFT is uh, officially, legally based in, in Brussels. But in fact, the core of uh, the SWIFT system is New York, right? Uh, no, China, China will not uh, desire to keep its, uh, let's say, its payment system uh, too dependent in its international operation uh, from this other system. And let's be frank, when it comes to digital payments, China is well ahead of the US. Any of us who has traveled recently to China, I mean, recently, last time I was there was uh, not virtually today, but uh, January of last year. And, and I didn't have to use neither cash nor, nor credit cards, not even credit cards, everything with a QR. Uh, and, and this degree of development of banking is more efficient. We are starting to get there. And, and, and obviously any dream, Chinese dream of uh, uh, internationalizing the RMB will pass by uh, providing reserves uh, uh, becoming uh, reserve asset for private investors outside of China, and definitely the connection of payment systems will be will be to the core. That's why I do believe that uh, along the the, the 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 broader Belt and Road Initiative will also come a, a push from China towards first with uh, central bank reserves uh, that is already at play, and that's more possible because it's. Officials with officials, mm. right? But then move on to the stage where, where reserve, uh, private agents uh, accept to 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 create reserves in denominated and 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 redeemable in Rembi. And that's when you will have the full fledged Rembi becoming a currency disputing with the dollar. And uh, but for that, it needs a payment system of its own, <laughs> and that's. That's probably the, the, the other battleground that will, would come, right, uh, connected with the telecommunications 5G and 6G and so on. So, Eduardo, in a nutshell, I guess those will be the core of, uh, of, uh, of disputes. Because on the other sectors, China has, uh, let's say, reached the stage where stealing technology is no longer uh, exactly. relevant. Uh, uh, now they have moved this sta that stage. So trying to fight the battle uh, where it, uh, now mm -hmm. China, like in Korea, uh, are you know uh, exploding number of patents mm -hmm. all over the world in in, in some areas. Uh, mm -hmm. So the old agenda is no longer the binding constraint on on, on China, not at all. But that one. Definitely on telecommunications and payment system will be the battleground between China and, and US in the near future, I bet. And let's see how the Eurozone behaves in that regard. Yeah, uh, as you, uh, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, the battle for the dollar and the payment system is there. So far, uh, so far, the renminbi has failed because <clears throat> there is very little trade in renminbi, and there, is, there are very few reserves uh, worldwide in renminbi. But as you know, the China is launching, as we speak, its own uh, e-currency. It's not blockchain, it's its own e-currency, as a way to, again, uh, succeed in a battle that so far has lost. That is uh, having the renminbi to become a, um, a reserve currency and a currency for international trade. So that's one thing. Second thing I wanted to say about, yeah, so Europe is a battleground. Uh, UK is giving up, of course, UK very soon in the next weeks won't be part of the European Union at all. It's not. 
uh, UK has given up and has accepted the threats from the US of not using uh, Huawei 5G technology from China. But again, uh, Brazil is, is another battleground. And this has, this has to be very strong collaboration between the private sector and the government to succeed into this battleground. And I would say, OI is for sale. So for a while, China Mobile, that is the biggest mobile company in the world, uh, but is still quite, well, is still is international, but not that much. So China Mobile said they were interested a few months ago. And then in the weeks after, Huawei said, you know what? I'll go to the bid of uh, to this bid to buy OI with China Mobile. Okay, a few weeks later, Huawei said, no, actually not. It's not true. Because of course, then everybody said, okay, what is this? This is a way for Huawei to enter the 5G technology to Brazil. In the last weeks, it would seem that OI has accepted an offer from Telefonica, uh, Team, and Claro, which but again, so these are very specific moments in which the government of Brazil should also take a position. Okay, OI is a private uh, company. Oh, well, oh, yeah, it's a privatized company in bankruptcy situation. But again, so if you, if you want or you don't, so you have to take a position. And we see a very specific case in which Brazil needs a medium-term policy. The same that for me, I was shocked when State Grid, a fully state-owned company, the biggest, one of the biggest companies in the world by revenues, and the biggest by very far electricity company in the world, when they bought a privatized electricity company in Brazil. So let's look at the details. The decisions in the electricity sector, in part of the electricity sector in Brazil, are taken by a fully state-owned enterprise from China. I mean, is this... So, again, going back to my previous point, what is happening has such an important caliber that the government of Brazil has to take, for instance, when the new government launched this privatization uh, program, I said, who is going to buy? Who has the funds to buy? And let's look at OI again. Telefonica alone could not buy it. Team alone could not buy it. America Mobile, so they had to form a consortium. And again, with all the oligopolistic possible consequences, but that's another matter. So anyway, I... Definitely the battleground, uh, Eduardo, for this decoupling in technology that we are already seeing is being fought in many places, definitely in the European Union, but definitely in Brazil and in South America. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure, Professor, I'm not sure. sure. Just sure, 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 sure. two things, an anecdote reinforcing what... Uh, 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 Ludis said, I, by chance, I was at the board of executive directors of the IMF in 2015, when the RMB was approved to be part of the special drawing rights. Of course, I was, I was there. With the strong support from the US. They, China had failed uh, ten, five years bef uh, before, but then it was, uh, the, the, the green light came from the US and, and they went through. And, and uh, to be part of the SDR, the Special Drawing Rights, there are three criteria. One of them, China got very easily the participation of the RMB in trade transactions, and that China got easy. The second one, to have bonds uh, issued and, and transactioned in two, at least two of the three large uh, stock markets in the in the world, and then China rushed and issued a bond in London, and that made possible Hong Kong, London, uh, to regarding New York to to comply. But the third criterion, China was 
left behind, which is exactly the amount, the volume, the, the share of uh, reserves uh, outside central banks of, uh, of, uh, of RMB assets. Uh, so there's a way to go for China to go in that regard, in that regard. Uh, but that's how they function, right? They hit the target and, and pursue it. Uh, but uh, it's a steep in this case because the private agents outside China are way to feel comfortable, confident that their money is not seized by, <laughs> by the Chinese. Uh, the second point that I'd like to make is the following, uh, reinforcing Brazil as a battleground. Uh, the, the, uh, I, I, not long ago, I heard the prime minister of Singapore, Singapore, which is close to China, uh, Singapore, uh, Lee Kuan Lee said once that he would not have followed his project of building a country of its own, of his own, had, it, had him not a uh, 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 green light from, from Deng Xiaoping, according to, to Lee Kuan Lee, because uh, Deng Xiaoping saw Singapore as an experiment. And as it succeeded, uh, according to the, the, the prime minister, <laughs> Singapore, uh, Deng Xiaoping went ahead with the reforms that led to the glorious 30 years and so on. So it was a way for the, 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 the creator of Singapore to say, China succeeds because of me. <laughs> well, it's okay. But the point is that uh, Singapore, the contingent of Chinese descendant, uh, the, uh, part, uh, is in uh, the Chinese diaspora and so on. So recently, the prime minister of Singapore, the current one said, don't ask Singapore to align automatically either to China or the, to the US. We will uh, uh, remain uh, dealing with both sides. It, it's, it's not understandable how we take the option of automatically aligning and losing a lot without gaining something that might compensate. That's uh, stupid. Still on the US, the US lacks, let's say the instruments uh, through which uh, do as the Chinese do. Uh, two years ago, I very enthusiastically, I must confess, too much maybe, I wrote an article for American Quarterly on the, the metamorphosis that was taking place in the Chinese investments in the, in the region, Latin America, moving from the bulk finance of money to the state uh, or to, to uh, quasi-state companies in exchange for guarantees of provision of uh, oil or copper uh, towards uh, a long-term non-arms length relationship through exactly what Lewis described, uh, foreign direct investment uh, in areas such as ports, such as energy, which have a long-term uh, to, uh, you know, and, and look, when we opened the, the oil, <laughs> the pre-salt oil, all the Chinese came, nobody else. Uh, where it lacks to the U.S., uh, they don't have a development bank, they don't have, they, they have to, to wait for the natural interest from private investors and so on. Uh, it, the lack of which leads them, I live in Washington, and over the last few years, I have been called for numerous events talking about China, Latin America. I've been participating in a PBS program uh, on that. And the, the, the government keeps saying, watch out for the Chinese. They corrupt. They dissolve and so on. But, but that doesn't, uh, does not substitute because the, the quick response from the, okay, so what else do you have to offer? Uh, and indeed, uh, this guy who won the IDB election, one with this campaign. Okay, through the IDB, we're gonna make the difference, but the size uh, is, is completely <laughs> insufficient in that regard. So uh, uh, words will have to be followed by actions uh, on the side of the US so as really to countervail uh, the, the attractiveness of Chinese investments. And China is playing the game. I heard with concern uh, President Bolsonaro uh, saying something this week about, well, China depends on the Brazil. Wow. Remember the example that I mentioned of uh, the Republic of Tatarstan producing soybeans? 
or Vietnam or Cambodia, the Chinese are making uh, steps, taking steps exactly to reduce the dependence vis-a-vis uh, -vis Brazil. This should be taken into account, of course. I don't know if you have some uh, last question. We have time for one or two questions. Otherwise, I can, uh, I would ask Professor Elizabeth Wabashevich to say the final words of the, the seminar. Okay, no more questions. So we are finishing our journey today. I think that we had a very interesting number of uh, sessions that addressed many key questions that are posed to us in our future, our near future, let's say, as a country and also as a as a global our situation the situation of the globe of the global context in front of these challenges posed by two different dynamics that are shaping our our world world today first there is the technological change the new technologies the uh, artificial intelligence and the changes that this uh, this key uh, changes in the in the in the techn technological field are posing to our society, and how the pandemic has deepened the, these uh, changes, and how now we are facing we are clearly facing the challenges that come from this side of the change that we are facing in, in our world. The other, the other question is all the changes that are reshaping the, uh, the, economy, the, the, the economy around the world. So we have this China, uh, China playing a new, new and quite uh, instigating uh, quite important new roles in shaping the, 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 the world, the international order. And now and then, and then we have this also the pandemic changing, uh, let's say, a dramatic, uh, dramatizing these changes. I think that uh, we have quite interesting uh, remarks that we will bring to our students, we will, we will bring to our, our research agenda, and I hope that we could make again, organize again a new, a new forum next, week, next year, maybe making a, 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 an assessment of what changes were so uh, really, really happened and what changes didn't happen. I think that's it. Thank you, everybody. And maybe and maybe make a book from this conference. Maybe yeah. transcript this conference and uh, make a book if the the panelists authorize this transcription and try to edit the book. I don't know if you think it's a good idea, but it's a it's a idea that came out in our discussion in preparation of this seminar. So in, in, on behalf of my colleagues, coordinator of the centers, I would like again to thanks for panelists, audience, and uh, for this excellent debate. Thank, thank you very much. I don't know if Eddie Plonsk wants to say something or... Just, just, just sign language. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe in pre President's Conference next year, maybe. Till next year, good. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you.